March 1st, 2021. This is Rook. As a young boy, he dreamed of starring in movies, and he left Iran at 13, staying in European refugee camps and hostels for years in order to be able to migrate. Now, Iranian-American actor and producer Armin Amidi has a strong career in cinema and design, and his latest film is the first American production to be released in Iran in 40 years. Armin Amidi coming up. But first, an award-winning British-Iranian visual artist who quite literally uses the soil, sand, and earth of Iran and other places in the world to create her spectacular pieces. Hannah Shahnavaz joins us from London to talk pigments, Persia, and painting. Plus, we have your letters about representation. I'm Gian Gomeshi. This is Rook. Welcome to episode 89 of Rook, coming to you from Toronto, Canada, with a salute to all of you joining us from around the world. Khoshamadin, welcome, durud, hastam ki mizun bashin. We're on an ongoing mission to build a new audiovisual encyclopedia of Iranian diaspora identity. You can find us on SoundCloud, on Instagram, on YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, Cast box and Telegram. How are you, Captain Reza? I'm great, sir. Um, you know, I was thinking about Armin Amiri, our yeah. second guest coming up today. And um, you and I are both people of Iranian descent. Right. Uh, you were in the diaspora. You came more recently from Iran. Yeah, I've been here my whole life. I visited Iran a couple of times, but I was a little kid. Uh, Shia is also more recently from Shia. is very recent. Couple yes, just came uh, a couple of years ago. Years. Uh, and I was thinking about the way we perceive life stories and how they can be profoundly different mm. based on our varying trajectories in our formative years. So so when I think about Armin, one of our guests today, he's this Iranian-American actor. He's gonna join us from Los Angeles in about 45 minutes or an hour from now. He's been in some feature films. He's now in a new film that he's also co-produced called The Night. Um, and I gotta say, I know Armin, he's charming, he's thoughtful, I'm looking forward to this interview. Uh, I know I can take it to some places that may surprise him because he, yeah. uh, I know he'll be honest, but Armin's story of leaving Iran is riveting to me. I mean, in the sense that he's this kid, yeah. you know, he's he dreams, he's got Bruce Lee posters and, and Michael Jackson is his yeah. idol in his room in Iran, and he just wants to get out. He wants to get to the West and pursue his dream so badly that at the age of 12, he asks his parents, can we just go, can I go? Um, they help him, he go, they go to Turkey for a year, and then his dad, and they're not a particularly well-off family, and it, his dad says, all right, well, if you wanna continue this, we can't, you know, fine, we're gonna go back to Iran. Yeah. And he spends the next four years in refugee camps. He goes through all of that just to get to the West. Yeah. It's a it's a happy ending in the sense that uh, Armin's got a successful career now in America. He's in a well-known actor, he's in Los Angeles. And there's some fun stories on the way. There's a Michael Jackson story I have to ask him about. But, but to me, that is so extraordinary. Like that, that story is the stuff of, of novels or, or, or movies, in yeah. fact. But when I mentioned it to you guys that he's coming on and I talked about this, and, and I know that you're not alone. A, a lot of Iranians who have been through this kind of thing just kind of go, yeah, yeah, well, we all sort of had to yeah. do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, not not everybody, of course. Some people just petition to become a, an immigrant and come, like my cousins or whatever have come. But the fact that you don't see this as the way I would, as such a crazy story, because no matter what difficulties I had growing up as an immigrant yeah. kid, I was I was in Thornhill worrying about high school, and uh, and this guy's at a refugee camp worrying about how he's gonna somehow become legitimate to be able to get to America. Yeah. You know? No, I hundred percent agree with you, and 
uh, when when you told me that's like you were and so you were so excited too you were like oh this guy has been like to refugee camps when he was so young and uh not that i wasn't impressed it's just that for me it was another monday <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's yeah i it, and for a lot of uh other iranian immigrants here um first generation mostly uh who migrated and went through sort of the same thing not right not necessarily the first wave not like my wave. parents no. or, or even folks who came earlier and make up the That's los right. angeles or That's washington right. dc communities or whatever but the ones who you guys who've come more recently mm -hmm. and especially if you had to come through political asylum right. or refugees uh, and i just hope you don't lose sight of how extraordinary yeah. these kind of stories are because it's uh it, it might be normal to you but, but that's the thing in order for us to for, for some for me personally to be able to keep it in the back of my head that this was an extraordinary adventure that i went through or armin has gone through yeah. is is for someone like you and this program to remind me of it yeah because it's so easy to get numb to the and even you i mean we've joked about it yeah. before yeah. uh but uh you know you end up in a chinese prison That's i right. mean you months. but you had the same thing you're a little older than armin but yeah. you were 18 years old uh -huh. this is like you know 15 years ago or yeah. something right yeah, and you yeah. and you're like uh, you wanted to get west yeah, so badly right. that you were willing to risk your life yeah. i mean it, yeah. it, you know uh, not to take anything away from contemporary Iran, the people living there and who want to stay there. I don't ever mm -hmm. want to create the conditions where we're suggesting that's a bad thing if somebody, w but these stories are just r are riveting They're to incredible. me. And for me, what's amazing is that there are so many of them. I mean, we had Shiva Nagar in the past. Uh, she's another Iranian actress in Hollywood who is, who is doing great work, uh, who had a very s rather similar story. She moved, uh, Navid Nagahban, who yeah. had, that yeah. funny enough, they're all in the, in the media. And, well, you're uh, mentioning the actors, but a lot of people, as we've talked to that's on this right. show, yeah, have, yeah, but what I'm have saying is There's so many that we, we've had quite a few actors who've gone through this, yeah. and w what are the odds of that? Yeah. But yeah I right. mean, the one thing that divides you from all of them is they're very successful. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> and I'm working but, for Rock. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> in, so anyway, Armin Amiri is going to come. Armin, you're the most successful. Oh, you know, I think I that. Know. Armin okay. Amiri is coming up. Uh, also, in just a few minutes, Hannah Shahnavaz. Now, she's got the opposite trajectory. Grew up in England, like me. Uh -huh. Goes back to Iran. Becomes this award-winning painter in London who makes absolutely gorgeous art out of pigments from the earth, minerals, plants, insects. Her work is brilliant. We'll get Hannah on the line from London in just a bit. Hello, Gruby Shia. Let me say a formal hello to you. Hi, hi. How hello, you? the fabulous Keon. Hi, Jian. Uh, how was your weekend? It was insig uh, insignificant. Insignificant. <laughs> I was like, is that the right word to use? Yeah. You know where I saw you? Where did you see me? I saw you on Clubhouse. Club? Oh, oh yes, that new app. Right. I don't get it. Well, you joined, right? I did, but I okay. still don't get I, it. I just joined, like yesterday yeah. or something. I, I don't totally get it either, but we're going to do something. On, we have to do something on to, Clubhouse. Yes, you know. yes. But I, I joined, and then I was like, now what do I do? Yeah, and I exactly. saw you there. You know? yeah, same but, thing uh, for me. but the funniest thing is I go, uh, uh, so it's this thing for people who don't know where it's audio you go into rooms and there's just people talking to each other right. and you can talk or you can just sit there and and uh i'm nervous about the whole thing like i you know i'll do a radio show or right. something i don't know I'm necessarily i don't know about this i i don't know how i feel about it yet Same. but uh I, you know i know that some people really swear by it chef haas is one of those people really? so i go into this room that chef haas is in you know <laughs> <laughs> and there's people talking and uh, so I'm kind of sitting there and when you go in the room you, like your face comes up and your name and, yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. and I'm sure no one saw me there and no one cares but for me it was like everybody knows that I'm in the room now <laughs> so then I'm like uh, uh, I want to leave the room because I got stuff to do first yeah. of all I I mean, I think I feel about this way about social media in general, but uh, and I know Savvy Roham's really in the clubhouse, and I'm sure we'll get into. It. But who has the time? Exactly. It's like really, do you? Exactly. I mean, I, I, there's already a couple of people I've seen uh, friends of mine who are constantly on clubhouse. I mean, what are you doing? Exactly. It, you're, I get it that you're talking on clubhouse, but anyway, I mean, all power to them. So I'm in the room. And I just want to leave now, right? And then I realize I don't know how to leave. <laughs> like, no, this is a true story. This is yesterday.
yesterday. <laughs> I was so like, good. okay, I'm in the room. <laughs> now, how do I get out, right? Because uh, I there's no button that says leave or anything. And I, what I had done is I had some. I made the wrong. I exited the room, but I didn't Deleted, leave the yeah. room or something. So I was still in the room, right? <laughs> so then I'm like, what's gonna happen? I'm gonna like, and I I don't trust it. Like, can they hear me if I go to the bathroom? Like, what's happening? Am I in the room? So I text Chef Haas, you know, <laughs> while he's in the clubhouse, you know, <laughs> and I'm like, how do I leave? And he says, uh, well, you just leave, you know, it, press the button that says exit quietly or something like that. And I'm like, I, where's that button? I mean, this was, this must have taken about five minutes or, you know, and, and, and poor, the poor guy, he's like trying to text me screenshots of how to get out of this room. And I was terrified. Like, how do I get out of the clubhouse room, you know? And uh, so, anyway, I mean, that's my first experience with Clubhouse. I'm sure but you know by now, but there, there's a little button saying leave quietly. Yes, well, yes. I found, finally it's found that. It's very visible, by yeah, the way. Yeah, no, but I had already left the room, but not in the right way. That's ah, why I didn't see that button. Got it. Anyway, there's just listen, two- I, if, if you want, if you're on Clubhouse, come say, follow me or join me or say hello to me or whatever. I don't know how this even works, but <laughs> we'll, we'll figure, figure out something to do. But it was nice to see you there. Oh, yes. I had some I comfort. Still okay. Used it, but yeah. Keon's there and also doesn't know what she's doing <laughs> in Clubhouse. House, you know, uh, <clears throat> I want to mention that we've launched our patrons page. This is uh, really exciting for us. So RookMedia.com. If you like our content, we're asking you to support Rook and keep our content as ad free as possible. So as little as ten dollars a month or twenty five dollars a month, you get Rook merch. Uh, you can do it for five bucks a month if you're a regular listener of ours. It really makes a difference to us. So uh, RookMedia.com. You press the support us button, which is a lot easier to find than the leave quietly button on Clubhouse, <laughs> for me at least. I want to give a shout out to a guy who is, uh, he's an Iranian Canadian entrepreneur and philanthropist named Mehdi uh, Azodi. Um, I think, I guess it's Azodi or something, Azodi. but he, he just says Me- Mehdi Azodi. You know, Mehdi has been a very successful guy in the in- investment sector and he makes it his priority to give back especially when it comes to the Iranian community. So he's been in contact, said he really believes in what we're doing with Rook and that our global diaspora needs programs like this in English. So he's given us a very generous one-time donation. It was unexpected, really kind. I even called him and said, wow, you know, can we plug anything for you? Can we talk about your company? He said, no, you know, I just love what you guys are doing and I want to help out. So a big shout out and thank you to Mehdi Azodi. Uh, thanks, Matty. That's very cool of you. We really appreciate it. And to all you guys out there who uh, who even for five bucks a month or whatever are becoming patrons and, and you don't need us to make a big deal about you, that it's very kind of you. Thank you for doing this. It's keeping us alive. All right. I know we have letters. We will get to all of that. Keon, Reza, Shia, see you in a bit. Let's get to our first guest. My first guest is a celebrated young Iranian-British painter, best known for her poetic and almost mystical paintings that are inspired by Persian miniatures and characterized by an abundance of exquisite detail. Hannah Louise Shahnavaz was born to a British mother and an Iranian father in London. After completing her Bachelor of Arts in Persian and the study of religions in the UK in 2008, Hannah moved to Iran and spent six years studying Persian painting. She then continued her studies back in London at the Prince's School of Traditional Arts, specializing in pigment, paint making, and Persian miniature, graduating in 2017. Being particularly inspired by Persian art and literature, Hannah mixes her own paints from Persian soils. That is, she takes pigments from earth, minerals, plants, insects, sand. She processes the rock or earth or plant from scratch into pigment, mixes pigments together, and makes her own paint. She also keeps these natural soils in small bottles in a an astonishing colorful collection. Hannah was awarded the Cicletera Prize for outstanding work presented by the Right Honorable Prince Charles, and her work has been acquired by the Islamic Arts Museum of Malaysia, where it has become part of the museum's permanent collection. And right now, Hannah Shahnavaz joins me from London, England today. Hello. Hello. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you for doing this. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. I'm really happy to be here with you today. How was the how has the pandemic period been for you? Has it been a fertile time as a creator during COVID or have you found it difficult to have your travel restricted and the world shut down? Um, to be honest, it's been um a flourishing um time. It's um yeah, it it, it went the other way for me. Um I think for me being forced to sort of being shut down. We've been in like quite 
a permanent lockdown in the UK. It's just basically turned off the noise of the outside world, you know, like the modern world. We've got noise everywhere. We've got constant social media. We've got opinions, visuals. And it, uh, it, it's not, I'm not saying it's negative, but there's a lot, you know, and we're constantly flooded with stuff and things. Yes. And so suddenly all of that, because I, I also left social media a while as well. I thought, you know what, why didn't I just leave everything? And I started jogging and, you know, to get some fresh air. And I sort of just sat out into the earth and then just being in silence and in my studio it kind of like um i don't know it took me to like a peaceful state and i just created basically my whole new collection which is still being created right now i, I just created it all through the pandemic um and I just, yeah, I'm so excited. You know, this, uh, of course, is a bit of a paradox when there's horrible things happening outside the window and people dying of COVID, and it's been a, a boon to some some artists like yourself. But but as it should be, because getting to know your art or a little bit about you, uh, I can understand why, even if it takes a global pandemic, if it slows us down, it would be mm -hmm. something that you appreciate. You know, uh, as I yep. get into this interview, your your art is is just so outstanding, and I want to get into that. But first, I have to say, the artistic work you do all seems very spiritual on some level, or comes from mm -hmm. a spiritual place. Would that be true? Yes, absolutely. It's it's all inspired, basically, from. I mean, it's gone on a bit of a journey, but. It was all inspired on these Persian stories that there's a co common theme for, you know, all these Persian sort of mystical poets and storytellers. It's based on this story of oneness and us basically wanting to reunite with the beloved, whatever you want to call the truth union. Um, you know, we've all been torn from like our, our reed beds and, you know, we're crying to be sort of back in that unified state again. Um, so it's all quite sort of mystical philosophy of oneness and love um, and ecstatic sort of wildness of the poet. And so that's what first attracted me. And that's what I sort of started all of my paintings based on. And now just as I've gone through my own process, paint making and working with the earth has taught me a lot. And I've learned a lot from A, slowing down, which is what you mentioned earlier. That was a huge, huge sort of inspiration for me. Um, and just connecting with the earth in a physical way. So actually, I've kind of gone opposite from when I started. I used to think, right, let's meditate and connect to the spiritual and talk about these abstract concepts. What paint making has done has made me think, has, it's made me stop and touch the earth, work with the earth mm -hmm. and interact with humans. You know, we've gone hiking together. I've, I've learned, you know, had sort of an insight from locals in certain areas. Um, and I've been really sort of more in touch with the earth and the physical world we're in rather than separate from it. And then through that, I've sort of started to understand more of these abstract concepts of what is oneness? What are we striving for? I don't know, love or anything abstract. It's become more tangible for me through being physical, which is, a, a, so now all my new work is more based on that. Um, I'm trying to tell stories of connection to earth and that's something all us humans can have and can understand. Obviously are different and some people find it more easier to understand abstract concepts than others. But one thing every human can understand is the physical, which is what I'm loving right now. And then we can move into the abstract together. But what I love about what you're saying is that um, it's not, it, even if it may have started as you're, you're thinking about oneness, how do I achieve this and trying to channel that into art, you're telling me that it's the process of making the art, regardless of the outcome, which happens yeah. to be award-winning now, but, but, uh, but it's the process that brings you in touch with that oneness. Yes. Ah. Uh. That's fantastic that you found something you can do that with. But I, and let, let me come back to that. But it, perhaps not unrelated to this, it's interesting to me that you did not actually, in the beginning at least, study art. But as I said in the intro, you were studying history and, and religion. How did mm. studying religion inform you as an artist? I think um, I, so I was um, at a university um school of oriental studies in london that had um, a persian department and so i specialized in um islam and obviously sufism which is the mystical aspect of islam and also um some yogic philosophy yoga and buddhism so that kind of brought me into a all this concept 
of oneness and going back to that divine source, that truth that's universal. All these religions, when you get to like the mystical aspects of these religions, they all end up saying the same thing, which which really fascinated me. Um, and also on the Persian side, it brought me into contact with certain poets. Rumi stole my heart, um, which again, they're talking about all these mystical um, philosophies as well. So that's that's how it all my art is based on storytelling and I, I like to discuss certain things via art so it all and that's what they used to do in, in all these ancient miniature tradition that is what they did art was connected to the poetry and it was connected to music you know it's all connected together yeah. and that's what i love connection Hannah, why Persian storytelling? I mean, this may seem obvious now that you've said things like, my paintings are not possible without Iran. Um, but, you know, on the face of it, it's quite an extraordinary thing to say. I mean, you're you're an artist, a profoundly talented one. You could presumably well, work with, there are stories that come out of ancient South America or East Asia or anywhere. And you're basically a British kid. Why is Iran so important to what you do? Well, it's what's, that's the thing. As things change. So certain statements I make, you know, it's oh, it's lovely hearing them again because it reminds me of the root. So now, obviously, in a new collection work, I've yeah, there's going to be new stories from right now. Um, and I'm working with a lot of philosophies and stories from tribes in Peru, and it's all taking on a new life of its own. But where it all started was Persian stories and. Um, I always like to pay homage to where things begun. So even in terms of Earth, the, the first Earth I ever actually took to make paint from was from Iran. But since then, you know, I haven't taken Earth from Iran in years. Um, you know, I, 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 I'm using rocks from all over the world and from different sources. And But that's where it began. And if it wasn't for that, none of this would be here. Gotcha, um, gotcha. Yeah. So for me, it's more, it's like, I, it's th that's the root of it. And let's let's go to the root of it. I mean, take take me back to your childhood growing up in London. You have, I understand you have an Iranian dad and a British mom. Yeah. So I'm, would it be right to guess that it was your dad who had an impact on you falling in love with Persian, Persian literature, culture, and art? Uh, tell us about Hannah as a kid. Well, both of them. That's the so my mother, she was always fascinated with um, Persian arts, you know, Persian, anything Persian cooking. And since childhood, she was, you know, taking us as well to Iran since my sister and I were babies and all our summers were there with our cousins. But it was more, it wasn't just my mother and father. It was my wider family, my aunties um, and uncles um, as well. And all my cousins, they just, and especially my aunties who left Iran and were living in Europe, it, I suppose, you know, it was, it was a connection they had to their culture that they had to leave. Um, and they loved it. You know, I grew up in a family that just it, Persian music was playing, Persian smells of the cooking and the saffron uh. in the kitchen. And all, it's all the senses, all the senses were so engaged with everything Persian. It was just in me. And I, I just loved Iran as a child. We used to play, you know, it, with the neighbors and in the streets and in, uh, the mountains and the smells. And it, it's all of that. It's everything from textures and the smells and the physical and the sounds. That said, it's sort of part of your upbringing, and it seems yeah. like it's relatively academic while you're um, getting your BA, you're studying Persian uh, you know, religion and Persian studies, etc. But then you move to Iran after the BA to study Persian painting under the tutelage of uh, master painter Safura Asadion. You continue your, your studies back in London at the Princess School of Traditional yeah. Arts, specializing in pigment and paint making and Persian miniatures, uh, whilst becoming an uh, Al-Bukhari Foundation scholar, if I've said that correctly. But it's this trip to Iran, those six years. I have mm. to imagine that that... Um, that's where you go from the academic to the to, to actually to literally getting your hands dirty. Yes. Um, t tell me about how that changed you. Um, everything. So you know, being in London and studying it, you know, bachelor's degree, um, like you said, it was all academic and very abstract. And I wanted to, I wanted to live it, feel it, smell it. You know, I'm talking about all these things. But I, I was in London and it's all in books and from the library and it just, I just wanted to be there. And it's not just, it doesn't always have to be complex things. And that's another lesson I've learned, you know, over the years. It could just be simply being 
um, in the country having a meal in the bazaar, you know, and, and seeing and smelling sounds and of just being in the mountains um, and being tactile. That's what changed it. So I went from that. I decided I'm going away from the academic abstract. I just want to live there. And I didn't actually go with the plan to paint, which is funny. I went there to play music oh. and just to live. Wow. Yes, and okay. the thing was all taken by surprise. Um, it wasn't a plan, and that's. I think that's what happens when you let life just organically take you. Things happen that aren't in the plan, and that's what happened with me. I, I had no pressure. I didn't put that on myself. I just said, I just want to live in Iran and be Iranian and be with Iranians and just be. Um, yeah, and then Wait life a second. happened. Okay, <laughs> I haven't seen this story anywhere in my. Uh, copious amounts of research on Hannah Shahnava. So so you so you're a British kid, albeit with an Iranian dad and a family and aunties who love Persian culture, etc. You pick up and you go to Iran and you think you're gonna just be visiting and playing music. How does this turn into becoming a world renowned artist who gets her hands dirty in the soils of Iran? What was tell tell us the story. What happened there? Um, so the story is quite it's quite random. So I decided just to live there for one year as well. I gave myself one year time out limit, which ended up being six years, obviously. Iran and and where did you first go? Tehran, I guess? Yeah, Tehran. So I was in Tehran um, and I went to study music. So I was studying Santur, which I first actually learned in London um, at SOAS. And then I started the setar um, and i was just walking around the streets with my friend one day in tehran just having a walk and there was this door open and we sort of popped our heads in and we saw all these paintings hanging it was this gallery um just this tiny little gallery in one of the the streets in tehran and i just fell in love with these paintings they were um big kind of canvases with flower and birds it was the gulamork tradition um and i just loved them and I, I i said you know is the artist here who's this and she was there and i said do you teach can you teach me please and so my friends and i just said yeah let's just it's a really great thing to do you know as what else you know another great thing to learn some persian culture and some painting how fun an evening class and then i just uh, it took me i ended up leaving music and just every day all day dedicated i spent yeah i ended up staying there for the next good few years and just dedicated myself wow. to painting who's that lady who's that artist are, you, are we still in touch with her no i mean times um have sort of i i, I kept as much in touch right. as i could right um it sounds like you owe her a lot walking by that walking in that kuche and seeing that gulamor art that day yeah, I, you know, as I said, I always like to remember my roots and the people that changed everything. You know, she became like a mother to me, a friend, um, everything, you know, ev everything, because it's it's not just her artwork. It was that she opened the door for me to even learn. And I just, yeah, I mean. The, all thanks have to go to the beginning you know back to the root so much of what you uh do and are as an artist is the the fact that it is the is the materials you use and the fact that you make your own paint you use the earth as we've talked about um if you if you'll excuse these sort of naive questions that i like to since we're getting to the roots of things wh why i mean why use earth sand dirt minerals to create colors from for your art i mean why not go to the local Tesco and uh, I don't know if Tesco sells paints, but <laughs> go to some British, <laughs> some British uh, shop and buy some paints. Uh, what is it about using the earth? Oh God, there's so many things. Okay, I'll try. Um, so there's a few aspects. So one, okay, let's talk about like the most obvious. It, it's visuals. So when it's made by hand, you know, I've I, when I'm processing pigment. That, you know, because there's paint making and then you can go even further back and actually make the pigment, which then you make into paint. I get certain decisions um, that will affect the visual effects. So, for example, um, the malachite rock um, in a lot of my work, if you see, there's this rich turquoise color. So that's made from malachite and malachite's funny. It's the same as azurite, which is the kind of electric blue that you might see in my work. The more it's ground in pigment form, the more it loses its color. And so because I haven't had any company doing it, any machine doing it, it hasn't gone through the rollers or anything. I am grinding it by hand. I can choose when to stop. I can choose the depth of color. There's lots of decisions still that I can make. Um, and then I process that into paint. And also when I make my recipes, I'm sort of making the recipes in a way that I can use the paint to create certain visual effects rather than 
what sometimes you have to do as an artist is you have to paint in a way that's correct for um you know the paints you have so i'm sort of like trying to create my paints in a way that will work with me it gives me more um power or let's say more creative expression uh, in terms of visuals mm -hmm. that's 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 one thing and another thing is like i said before connection to nature i like that i have to physically work for my art so there's that energy it's a real kind of rough let's get the energy out let's grind let's use those muscles and it's like exercise um and then afterwards i can sit and meditate and you know do the whole meditative aspect you go through this whole journey of alchemy and so you're in the process the beautiful sacred process of um help you know being part of transforming one substance into another and that can even go as far back as you digging it and who who's with you you know what conversations are you having i climbed that mountain and i fell over when i was climbing there and we laughed about it do you remember that and you know it, it's just, and so then when i look at my paintings i can see all these stories and histories and the paint is so alive and that one came from that berry and this one came from you know that mineral and all oh, that one was a gift from that geologist in america they sent me that you know i, I source my pigments from all different sources it's not just me collecting it and i've met beautiful friendships by us connecting you know and people sending me gifts of rocks from around the world and it's like wow we connected through a rock wow i mean mm -hmm. what a beautiful friend i've made and then i see that in the in the painting so yeah oh, so many so reasons. i love the stories behind them and i love the can i get uh, i wish i could feel it as profoundly as you do i guess maybe i have to go literally and put my hands in the in the dirt and spend some years doing this but i but the, i love this connection to the natural world and mother earth and what that feeds in you uh, what i'm curious about when it comes to the actual colors yeah I'm, I'm curious whether um whether the audience whether you can this is to take nothing away from the the the, the majesty of your work I mean, it, it is it is rightly uh, award winning work what you do, but but I wonder if you think the audience or if if you know that the audience can see a difference. In other words, this palette, these pigments, these colors that you are able to extract, can the average person discern? Or will the average person discern see something different in your painting and go? maybe they don't even know it's because it's a color that they haven't seen, but will they see something that they wouldn't see if you went and bought the, the paints at, at a paint shop uh, because you're such a good artist and mix them and put them on a canvas? Yeah, I mean, I personally believe that, you know, every type of pigment has its place, um, you know, so it's not just that earth is beautiful minerals. And this year I've started to experiment with, you know, other types of pigments that are, you know, made in different ways and it's all alchemy and, everything has its place but there are differences and so since I've sort of also been experimenting and you know if, if I put them side by side you really can um you know there is when it's an actual mineral um it's if you go down to like the particles and how it is it, it's not uniform because it's not it, you know it's not synthesized in a in a lab in a uniform way and so what happens is it's play on light so the light the way it bounces through you know these particles for example in lapis lazuli it's a really complex blue you've got shadows of purple in it if you put that next to an ultramarine the ultramarine synthesized in lab can be quite yeah. you know sharper and it's got sort of what it hasn't got the complexity i'd say of a mineral um for me that's fascinating and then you get a slight crystalline in certain um pigments you know rather than a a flat matte color it's the way i think it always goes back to light in terms of pigments um and it's the way light bounces and refracts through and it does have a different complexity but one thing i've noticed from what people say when they view my artwork in person is they say it's it, it they say it's really funny because it's very colorful and so you've got really bright colors, which is what obviously minerals give. Yeah. But it's not mad and psychedelic and it doesn't bother the mind. It's quite soothing. So I think that's what working yeah. with natural yeah. pigments allows you to do. You can, if you look at my work, I use every single color, but it's not mad. It doesn't upset the mind because there's some kind of harmony in it. At the end of the day, it is a mineral, it's earth, it's a plant. So it is soothing and you can use, whereas if you just used all these, um, say like bright, synthetic, sharp colors, you know it it sometimes can be a bit too mad i think that so i think certain it does lend itself to See, where, where i was coming from on it and 
the analogy I would use is, you know, my background mm-hmm. is music and, and I'm a drummer. And so I, I feel like live drums, if I were to play something on the drums and record it, will mm-hmm. always feel and sound different than what you can create with a machine. And mm-hmm. you can create yeah. incredible things with machines now, you know, I mean, yeah, you can, yeah. yeah and, I'm, is- and I'm never sure, I'm never entirely sure if, if the audience, if somebody listening to a track, you know, would care or know the difference if it's real drums or if it's not but i feel like they'll feel the difference you know unless it's a song that actually requires sort of technical robotic drumming or something you know i feel like they'll feel the difference and that's what i was thinking of when it comes to your art and these colors yeah i just i I just think it's a spirit it's a vibration it's an energy it's something and sometimes you don't know it i mean i'm just thinking also like i'm just a person as well so i'm putting myself in the place of a viewer i am a viewer i love art and i'm thinking before i even set my eyes on this stuff what attracted me to it you know so i mean i didn't learn any of this natural pigments in iran i was using acrylics in iran and what was it that made me think i need to go to england and i really need to learn to work with earth and these minerals so there was something in it that took me who I, I'm not from an art background and my eyes weren't accustomed to it but you know so so I there was something in it that just grabbed me and it brought joy to my heart and it made me feel alive and then that sense of being alive and just I thought well if I'm feeling that of course others must know we're all just people um right. so you're right we can't explain it sometimes but there's something in it and I I just I, I think I would just put the word life there's life in it Uh, and it's a story it's got a story it's it's got a root it's got an origin um but you know uh, it's funny that you should say that in iran you were using acrylics because (laughs) i was i was going to ask you i mean i was going to say is the method that you use to make your paint the the same method that old persian masters used uh, or is this something new that you've come up with so so did, did where did you even learn to do this this kind of mixing of the dirt and the sand and the and the minerals and the pigments so i i learned at university so when i came back to the uk as part of our ma degree um we learned pigment making and paint making and then i just and uh, so we got all the base sort of recipes that are really international so it is how the persians used to make it it is how in europe they used to make it and obviously um, all these different traditions had their own methods of doing of extracting color but they're sort of base recipes um and then over time i've sort of um just by experimenting and tweaking my recipes again in the way that i needed for the way i paint because I, I i paint in lots of layers in certain ways that the old recipe wasn't working and so just like cooking you know you've there's base recipes and then you can tweak it but um i didn't learn it in iran i i mean i couldn't find it in iran it's not something that's really being taught there anymore but it is part of iran's heritage and it's how they used to make it for all the manuscripts all those be- i mean looking if you hold these manuscripts in your hands in person i think that's what changed my life as well i i went to the um, british library in london and just took out loads of old iranian manuscripts and to feel that paper and see the minerals dazzling you know mm-hmm. from god ancient you know years and years and years ago with my eyes you can just yeah, it's how they used to do it. Um, now, now, let me ask you this. I know, I know that you care profoundly about uh, the Earth. You've talked about that, and so that uh, so you're not given to running around the world and uh, um, taking buckets of, of, <laughs> of soil from <laughs> the various places of the world. But the, but to ask you a serious question about that, I mean, there is a movement of Iranian environmentalists who are against the taking of Iranian soil, especially the soil of Hormuz Island, for various reasons, including cosmetics, yeah. paints, etc. What what do you think about that movement and what is your philosophy around the taking of Iranian soil out of the country? Iranian soil, um, I mean, yeah, there's been such a, a debate and especially the last few years. It's the reason why I won't touch it anymore. Um, it's a personal thing. I'd never, you know, condemn or uh, anyone or any, it's not my place at all. Um, but for me personally, I just feel that if there is um, certain areas in the world that are protect, protected and environmentalists are saying, you know, we shouldn't take that and we need to protect it, I, I would prefer as an artist not to be someone taking it. Um, so when I took it, you know, years ago, I asked, you know, the locals there and there was a specialist there that works with it. And I said, what's, you know, what, what's the deal? And can I take a bit? And he said, absolutely. And then I think... Um, was it a year after or two years after? I think there were protests and they um, stopped. There was a big factory exporting red earth, which was making them 
very upset quite rightly you know it's really ruined um the the islands taking all of that red earth and exporting it and they succeeded um the locals and so now that's when i went back last time it was completely shut down so yeah i i personally won't take from there again and it's funny the day i said to myself um I don't want to take from there. Whatever I have now, once it's gone, it's all finished. Um, I got contacted by someone in the US and said, can I send you a gift of certain rocks I have? You know, be good for your art. And I was like, oh, thank you. Wow, amazing. I got sent these fascinating rocks that I never would have had access to or thought about using that in my color palette. And then that changed my color palette a bit more. Mm -hmm. And and it took me on like a wilder journey. So it's, it's sort of taken out my hands. And I just think, yeah, it's an important debate. It's an important discussion. It should be talked about. Yeah. And it's wonderful it's talked about because it means people care about the environment. Um, and I, I don't want to do anything that, yeah, it is not is not okay for the environment. So in those instances, I, I, personally, I just, I would abstain. Uh, understood. And uh, uh, and by the way, as a, parenthetically, you, you are welcome to use any of the dodgy bog that is at the back of my oh. uh, back of my house in Canada if you need any of that. Oh, brilliant. Uh, well, that's exciting. <laughs> that sounds different. See, something different for the palette. I mean, <laughs> I'll check with the neighborhood, but I don't think they'll care <laughs> if you take some. I mean, there's some nice grass, but beyond that, it's really... Look, uh, I'm not fussed. I'll take any. <laughs> can can you can you teach me about um, uh, uh, Persian miniatures or or first of all I, 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 there's a debate in in our office do we do I say is miniatures is the is the English of that miniatures or is that uh, is that somehow superficial to say that uh, how, how do we say that in English in English I say Persian miniature okay okay so so let me ask you about Persian miniature uh, wh- why are you so captivated by Persian miniatures what 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 can we learn from them um so there's a few things um I, I love the stories but that's I mean that's the stories and the horses and the way the prince and princess figures that aside I really love um, the flat perspective I love the fact that if you look at Persian miniatures, especially all before it gets into the later period, so um, all all before the Qajar um, and end of the Safavi, all, I, I love the ones all coming before, especially the Timurid era. It's very flat perspective. And if you look at the older miniatures as well, um, you can see it's not, there's no modeling of faces like the Mughal miniature art. It's, you know, the colors aren't like what you'd see in nature. You know, these bright minerals, you might get like purple grass, you know. Um, hmm. And the reason I like that, especially in the figures, is they become like a template. Um, it's like an archetypal form. It's really talking ar- archetypes. So when you look at the princess, it's so flat perspective and 2D and simple in terms of facial features and the skin that anyone can be that princess, anyone can be that lover. Um, you don't suddenly see, oh, that princess is that and that's her history and you don't have any of those emotions coming along. And that really hones it in for me in one of my exhibitions um, in Saatchi. I had um, my big painting. I always like to do a big mother painting and it was a princess and a prince who, yes, I called Shirin Khosrow, um, as lovers having a feast together. And there was this um, British couple, just very, very typical British couple. They came up and they didn't know anything about the story, anything about who the princess and prince was. And they went up to it and immediately said, oh, my God, that's us. Wow, that's us. And they bought it. They loved it. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And, and, they, and they kept saying, that's us. That's us. Oh, my God, that's our love. And it was amazing. They could see that that's them because it's such a template. It's such a simple way of figure the design. You can imagine you're, you're not seeing a character on there, someone's portrait on your wall. And I love that. It's like we can relate to it. It can connect to anyone wow. from any culture, anywhere. And they don't know <laughs> that this is there's a love story, Khosrow and Shireen. And no, they're... they had no idea. And then I told them and they loved it even more. But they connected with it instantly without knowing it because they could immediately feel themselves as those characters because it was so just 2D and simple faces. So I, I, that's why I don't model my faces. I don't make them obviously. It, it could literally be anyone. I love that about Persian miniature. It's brilliant. It's magical. Yeah. Because what I, you know, I I wouldn't look at um, an old Titian painting and say, oh, that's me. You know, that (laughs) doesn't, (laughs) 
<laughs> I, 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 you know what I mean? It's 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 very um, uh, it's it's very instructive. It's very interesting to 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 hear that 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 these people felt that way. You, you mentioned horses. You you use horses a lot. Um, I know that they're they are often elements of Persian miniatures, but um, they seem to be more important to you and bolder in your art. What what why are horses so important? Well, I grew up with horses. Um, so, you know, the most most simplest answer is I just, I love horses. I'm a horse mad girl. Um, and for me, horses just symbolize a lot. And it's from personal experience and sort of how I feel that when I'm riding my horse, it's that moment where time disappears, society disappears, the world disappears. And it's just that connection where, well, my legs are actually the horse's legs. The horse is like flying through the countryside with me on its back. But then my head's in the air flying through the sky. And it's that I'm in that middle point, that apex of feet on the ground, head in the sky, earth mm. and sky connection. And at the same time, I'm sitting connected to this being who's another being. So there's the heart element that comes into it. Two hearts connected um, and then freedom and all, and horses are wild. So it's that wild spirit. And also the fact that us humans, wow, we can connect to that wild spirit and, and have a partnership. Mm. It, wildness isn't something to be feared and we can connect with it. And then time disappears and, and we can connect again at the same time. We're connected to the earth and to the sky and we're wild at heart. I mean, that's, it just means so much. That's beautiful. Why do you live in a city? By the way, listening to you talk, yeah. I mean, could you could you not visit London? This is like you're in one of the biggest cities in the world in yeah. London. I'm, <laughs> I, why not? Why not take a drive two hours north and and you know find some land in the in English countryside since you love it so much. I know people expect that. I I actually grew up in the countryside in the village. It's, do you know? I think. Every day I'm with, I, I get time out I'm with my horse and I'm in the nature. But there's something about London and the city. It's energy. It's yes. vibrant. Yeah. It's alive. It's fascinating. And all this, art, everything that comes about, it's not just me. You know, people don't realize that what's behind it. Like right now where I'm sitting, I've got these amazing like team with me who we get inspired with each other. I meet interesting characters in the city. Everything is connection it's not so in like amazing things can happen when you're connected and you interact and i love that access that a city gives um it, it's not i don't want to be alone i don't want to be asleep i don't want to just see the same thing at my window all the time it's, um, it's one of the best places in the world london i mean there's no doubt i believe i want to come back i've been excited actually to come back to um as we end off this this interview to to come back to the notion of um of, of patience. You know, there was a movement, um, I don't know where it's at right now, but about 15 years ago, um, and actually it was, its epicenter was, was London, uh, uh, called the slow movement where Okay. It was, um, it was, uh, uh, I'm trying to remember the, the name of the author, uh, but uh, he wrote a book uh, that it was about, you know, learning how to actively try to slow down our lives in a world that has become affected and infected by speed being the currency, you know, social media and all, all you know, the madness of our world. And um, that, this spoke to me very personally because I, I'm caught up in that uh, the speed of life that I, I'm, I, I wish I, and I wish I wasn't. I wish I, I, I recognize that it would be healthier to slow down. But how does one do that when one is, you know, uh, involved in the current kind of world that we're in, especially if you live in a city and you're the kind of work you do and all of that? You, you spend, if I've got this correct, months, in some cases one or two years, to pay paint you know one 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 of your works i mean it means you live with a work for a couple of years so the process of selecting the story first of all the paint must be very difficult and important but it's also got to be this exercise in patience and that is something that you have said you really value tell me about the importance of patience and simplicity that comes from painting and what we can gain from that kind of process well it's funny if you think about it, like I was thinking about this the other day, um, think about like, I, right now in the modern world, we pay so much money to go to a yoga class, to go to meditation, to do all these things. And it's like we're paying to learn how to breathe how to sit, how to be still, and what does it do? Like when we empty ourselves from all this noise and, every, you know, we somehow get clarity and that's where true creativity comes. We can't get 
creativity and i'm not just talking about painting it can be in anything if there's no space there has to be space um and so that that's what patience and slowness has taught me it's it said that look we don't i don't need to rush everything so fast fast food fast information let's not use our brains let's not research let's not connect let's just go and google it get the answer and go boom 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 and it's like you miss out on so much stuff like like really in-depth stuff and and th- again like creativity so for me that's that's really what it's done and it yeah the, I mean the mother piece takes me a long 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 time and it's amazing so I live with it and it takes on a life of its own and it becomes a baby and it's a huge emotional goodbye <laughs> goodbye when it has to leave me to go to its home because I've lived with it and every single flower I know I, I you know I feel the color the pigments the stories you know, I remember how I was feeling that when I did that flower, I was in this phase of my life. I go through so many phases in one painting because it takes what happens in a human's life in two years. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just, it's mad when you think of it like do that. You, do you have people around you, I don't know, an agent, an art dealer or some who try to encourage you to work faster? I mean, the, the whole world is based on pump it out as fast <laughs> as you can, you know, make more money. Do By the way, the guy's name was Carl Honoré. I remember his name is Carl Honoré, uh, who wrote no. the book. It's called, the book is called In Praise of Slow. But That's um nice. But uh, but uh, but how do you resist get, getting involved in what we would colloquially call the rat race? You know. Yeah. So um, I think you always have to pay your dues. <laughs> and let's say the first three years were hell for me, having an insane like year deadline to get a collection together and exhibit um, at Saatchi, and all that pressure of also being exhibiting in a gallery like that, where suddenly you're going to be exposed and everyone's going to see. Um, so I had to deal with the fact that I didn't get to finish my paintings as I would have loved. But luckily for me, I had lovely collectors, the buyers that let me finish afterwards. And now we've got to a place where we do everything in-house. Um, I've got my collectors coming directly to me, the new collection. We're going to set our own date. Um, so I don't actually have an agent or a middleman, um, which is just a blessing. We're doing everything now in my own studio, um, doing everything ourselves. So I'm not getting into the rat race um it's on sort of my timeline now but i did do that the first three exhibitions i did and it killed me i've yeah i've had my breakdowns and tears and and worries and oh it's not finished though i wanted it to finish but you know because they want it fast and they've got a deadline do um, you how how rigid uh, again i'm i'm uh, i'm i think the value of this patience and simplicity and uh, is not just is 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 incredible and i wonder how you how you manage it so do you have a uh, how rigid are you about your schedule? Like, do you have to put in yeah, a certain I, amount of hours each day at the studio to make yourself feel okay? Absolutely. Or, or? I, I paint. So, so like my average days when I paint, it would be like 16 hours towards exhibition. I was doing 20 hours solid, four hours of sleep, which is, I think, why probably the tears came at the end. It's so much lack of sleep. I just, the only way for me to get the hours I needed was to cut out the sleeping time um, and eat healthy and just get my exercise with my horse and actually taught me that I guess human beings don't need as much sleep as possible, but it's not sustainable. Um, so because that way is not sustainable, that was how I've done it. I'm now in a fortunate position. I've got a beautiful team around me where, you know, I can delegate certain things. Um, you know, it's just, you know, like the business side I'm, I'm not doing. I can't do my social media. There's certain things that can be delegated. Right. Um and it helps because otherwise it's just not possible. You don't but even paint. I, you don't even paint yourself anymore, right? You're just sitting there with chai. Oh, you're sitting there with a chai and and like, <laughs> get to work. You've got oh, interns God. running around with paintbrushes. <laughs> Absolutely! Oh damn it! You busted me. Um. <laughs> you know your 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 works feel very. Uh, and forgive me if there's something I haven't seen that is more, uh, <laughs> you know, dystopian, but your works feel very positive to me, affirmative, yeah. beautiful. I, yeah. Is that a conscious decision as opposed to darker material? Yeah, I mean, it's naturally what comes out of me. Um, I'm fueled by beauty and, and positivity and just, you know, all, all that goodness. But it is also conscious. I don't, I, I don't want to uh, produce darker work because I think 
one thing universal to all humans is we can all face beauty. We can all get inspired and are lifted by beauty. We see a lot of darkness, but by painting beauty, it doesn't mean we can't talk about dark issues. So last year I started to do um, a lot of like charity project, projects or certain charities. And, but I, I, I've been painting. So you'll see, I mean, there's more projects to come out, but by painting certain things in a beautiful way, and we can still discuss, you know, we can still discuss these difficult themes and, you know, difficult aspects of the world and what can we do. But I want to be positive in that we are creators of our own destiny of a world. We can create a world that we want as, as you know, human beings. We can be more at one with everyone and nature. And, you know, we can take an active role in creation. Um, and I think that's really positive. I really like things to have a practical, you know, like, effect we can and I, I want my art I mean that's the hope to sort of have some kind of practical points in the world we're living in um, and that's why it's positive I just think everyone so with can, all you know, of the things that Iranians have gone through especially in the last 42 years you know yeah. whether it's planes being shot down or the revolution itself um, your answer to that would not be to, to express that on canvas in a in a um, through pathos or through some kind of dark scene, but to respond to that with positivity? You know, um, well, first of all, only obviously speaking personally, because I think every artist and every person, you know, will have a different sure, idea. Sure, 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 yeah. So, but the way I would, yeah, for me, it would have to be not saying that the subject is a good thing, but by painting something, you know, to discuss you know, so let's let's say, for example, there's like this really awful thing we want to talk about and we need to address that and we need to look at it. I'd want to paint it in some kind of visually appe you know, appealing way. So it first invites all viewers in rather than only allowing a certain viewer who can handle it and some will be turned away. I want to first give a door that, you know what? Everyone can handle this. Everyone can view it. That's step one. Second one, well, second step, what's it about? Let's discuss what it's about. And before you know it, everyone's in this discussion. That was a difficult discussion and a, and a sad discussion. But before you know it, everyone's in it because that's what beauty does. And, you know, if it's appealing, we can all kind of take a step, one step at a time through the door. Um, and I, the reason I do that thing is because I'm like that. Um, mm. I was thinking, like, for example, in terms of um, the thing that really I'm passionate about in life is... Um, abuses that are done to animals like in the animal kingdom and if i'm shown something of say an animal being tortured or hunted i just want to run away i find mm -hmm. it really difficult mm -hmm. to face it and then i don't end up discussing it and I, and I hide and i wish i wasn't like that but i am like that and it's not a bad thing it's the way i'm built and there's many humans built like that whereas if i'm faced with um you know, don't scare me away. Show me something I can face. Now I can have the discussion, right, how can I help? And there's many like that. So I hopefully my art can be more for those people that need that way in to those difficult discussions. That's so well said. And people people really are exhausted by negativity at this point. <laughs> it's, it is all that our, you know, sort of media can uh, traffic in at this point. So it's well, it shuts uh, down hope. I, I really do feel like the more we bombard people with negativity, it gets to a point there's only so much a human being can handle. So what do we do? We shut down. We want to hide in the world of Netflix. Let's get take with, you know, everyone has their coping mechanisms or let's consume more or let's go into our bubbles. You know, there's there's a lot. There's We're being overfaced. So I kind of want to provide a way of saying, look, guys, there is hope. No, we can create a new world. What world do we want even, you know? Or let's first discuss what world we want. And then let's start maybe creating it together. But we can do it. And so I just think uplifting things, there's a place. It's not just pretty art for the sake of being pretty, you know. it, it Uplifting art can do a lot. And without hope forget anything else I, we, we as humans we do need hope and so one way of providing hope is at least let, let's just bring joy let's light up people's hearts first and then let's go from there you mentioned charities that you work with tell mm -hmm. me tell uh, I'll give you a, a chance to do a shout out here tell me tell me about earth for earth so earth for earth that was sort of my first stepping stone into um, working sort of into the charity world and so i thought with the Earth for Earth, um, obviously every collection I do, I've started to um, put a bit of the specimen of that pigment into a bottle and they look so beautiful together. I've just like framed them in this kind of big pigment cabinet. And 
my first one I did, it wasn't for sale. I didn't even think anyone would want to buy, you know, bottles of earth. But they kind of just, we've had so many requests. People went mad um, just wanting to purchase the cabinet. So then I thought, I don't want to sell earth to make money. Um, why don't I then, fine, let's agree, let's sell it but give all the proceeds away to charity, which is a beautiful cycle of, in essence, selling earth for earth to give, mm. back, give back to the earth. And funnily enough, my whole career all happened from earth. It all began from me collecting earth and it's still all fueled by earth. So let's give back to the earth. Let's just, instead of me always talking about, oh, earth humbles me working with earth and I love earth, let, let's do something also practical. You know, I don't just want to talk about it. Um, and so we, yeah, I, I, there's two charities. Um, the first Earth for Earth I split between. One is um, called HSI, Humane Society International. And they do absolutely fantastic work, um, all based on animal. Um, and the other one is um, learning um, through horses. It, it's, a, it's a charity in London that teaches um, disadvantaged children how to have, for example, function in society. They might find it difficult either from the, because of their home backgrounds or they've got certain issues. And so via horses, via working with horses, they learn certain social skills or they learn um, certain things that they need to for class, but they struggle in the classroom. And so I, that, I split it between those charities. And I, I, I decide I do want to continue with HSI, Humane Society International. And of course, I'm always looking for new charities. There's, I mean, there's so many amazing charities in the world. So that that was a sort of stepping stone. And I've got more projects now this year we'll be doing. <laughs> it's exciting. It's such a pleasure to get to talk to you, Hannah. I, I, I really appreciate your insights. I'm in awe of your work. We will put a link to your website so that people in the period of COVID who can't get to the Saatchi Gallery or to the uh, the, the Museum of Malaysia <laughs> present can get to see some of your works. I thank you so much for doing this. Um, what, what did it mean to get to, to be recognized by Prince Charles? Did you did you actually get to meet him? I did. Yeah, I did get. So he came to um, our exhibition. And, um, you know, we got to, yeah, I actually got time with him and he looked at all my work and, got to, and he loved um, the flowers. So it was really interesting getting his insight. And he even actually spotted certain flowers in my Persian miniature. He said the actual botanical name and picked that right out. Which was oh, wow. Really cool. oh. <laughs> so he even taught me actually. He was, he like, was doing <laughs> Prince Charles. He was doing, that's what he's supposed to know about gardens and yeah, botanical. Yeah, so yeah, that was, and then it was actually, um, um, David um, Secretara, who, um, you know, kindly chose my work um, to then display at Saatchi. And then Prince Charles um, came and awarded, you know, presented the award um, on that day. So it was, it was amazing. It was just like a dream. I didn't, when they called my name, my husband had to push me forward because I, I actually, I don't know why, I just, I did a blank. I, yeah, it was. <laughs> you forgot <laughs> your name. I really <laughs> forgot my, yeah thought he pushed me um thank god i didn't go falling on the floor but yeah that was lovely so uh, thanks to you know all that's just, fantastic all i mean i don't know mind you i don't know if you've seen uh season four of the crown but i'm very upset at prince charles for the way he treated lady die <laughs> Don't know, I haven't even started all of that yet. So <laughs> <laughs> be careful. Spoiler. Be careful. It'll shift oh, your image of the of the man. No. <laughs> I don't know how much of it's true or not, of course. <laughs> Thank you so much. It was such a pleasure. And I, I hope we get to, to see each other in person before we, once That'd this be COVID amazing. thing is done. But in the meantime, I'm thrilled that you're doing the, the kind of work you're doing. Oh, thank you so much. And it was such a pleasure. And it was really lovely um, to speak to you. And the next thing I'm going to do is order in praise of slow. Um, so you've made my day. Thank you very yeah, much. I think you'll I think you'll dig it. I mean, it's you know, it's, it's a few years old now, but the, it, it, all of it will oh, still make sense. And it's so relevant to now, yes. actually, yes. with the time and appreciate the slow because we're forced in a way to being slow. So yes. Thank, yeah. you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Hannah. Cool. Take care and have a wonderful day. And thanks again. Khodafis. Khodafis. That is award-winning Iranian-British painter and visual artist Hannah Shahnavaz. Her works can be seen online at her site, which we will link to from rookmedia.com. Hannah Shahnavaz joined us from London, England today.
find the hub of all things Rook. Rookmedia.com is our site uh, where there's links to all of our platforms there. Uh, and each week now we are putting up uh, videos of our own dear chef Haas giving you instructions on um, how to become a genius in making uh, Persian cuisine. And the latest one is uh, uh, Chef Haas talking about the best way to use Barbary's Zereshk in your Persian cooking. Rookmedia.com. You can find our patrons page and all of our episodes there as well. Microphones are back on. I see Captain Reza, Groovy Shaya, the fabulous Keon. How about that Hannah Shatnavoz? This is wonderful. I, uh, she made me crave and miss going through art galleries so much. You know, we, we have... We're blessed to live in a city like Toronto. Meanwhile, we're not able to, you know, marvel at new art and incredible work by people. So it it just it reminded me of how important the arts are. Well, like without the arts, we would just be empty souls. Mm. Yeah. I am. Uh, I wasn't kidding when I was sounding as passionate as I am about that book, uh, In Praise of Slow. I loved hearing that for her. It's. Uh, it's the it's the journey, not the destination, when it comes to her art. And the other, you know, she it's the she wants to take her time. It's about the process and what that does to her spiritually, energetically, mm. and to her mind to do something that is isn't about the speed of life, isn't about you know right. going a, a a thousand miles a second. Um, and that was really really beautiful to hear that that's what painting has uh, her, her art has taught her. Uh, Shia, do you want to weigh in on anything? Uh, first of all, I love the interview. I love the discussion about actually the praise of slow. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah. And please, I, I will borrow it from you. I will, hand, I will yeah. lend it to you happily. And also, um, the Hormoz Island, I, there's a one place that I highly recommend it to all people who, who are traveling to Iran that fa go and see the Hormoz Island. It's uh, fascinating. The red uh, soil of the island is really amazing. I don't know a lot about Hormuz Island. Is it is it a it vacation kind of place or more um, of a... No, actually. It's it's like a hippie vacation. Mm -hmm. oh, you have to I go see. there and ta uh, stay in tents. Right. And yeah, it, it's amazing. It's oh. really amazing. So I can't bring my hair straightener. <laughs> <laughs> no. You wouldn't be able to plug it in. That was a joke. <laughs> I, Are you sure? Uh, yeah, I, right. It was a joke. I can bring my hair straightener. I have a battery <laughs> operator. Uh, <laughs> Captain Reza? Uh, nothing else to add other than that. Yeah, I really enjoyed the interview, and the, I didn't know about the Hormuz Island, actually. Believe oh. it or not, I lived in Iran most of my life, but I didn't know about that. Fascinating. Do you know Tangay Hormuz? Of course I know okay, Tangay Hormuz. Okay, it's, it's an island in the middle of Tangay Hormuz. No, 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 I knew that Hormuz Island existed. Oh. I didn't know that the soil, like, oh, was... Yeah, There's a country called Iran. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard Captain of it. Captain Reza. I've heard of it, and <laughs> I was You used to in live in it, yeah. <laughs> Um, I know we're going to get to some uh, some interesting letters coming up in a little bit. So uh, thank you uh, for sticking around, you guys. We'll uh, we'll get to that. I want to get to our our next guest. I've been looking forward to this. My next guest is an Iranian American actor, producer, and interior designer. Armin Amidi was born in Tehran. He left Iran at the age of thirteen, first for Istanbul. After a year and stops in Bulgaria and Yugoslavia, he then arrived in Vienna, Austria, to seek political asylum. In 1989, Armin moved to San Francisco and thereafter studied at ACT Conservatory before moving to New York and pursuing acting. Armin has extensive range and an impressive resume. His films include Terry George's Reservation Road, The Wrestler, starring Mickey Rourke, Factory Girl with Guy Pearce, and Septembers of Shiraz with Wayne Blair. Armin's TV credits include Deep State and NCIS New Orleans, to name a few. Alongside his artistic work, Armin has had a successful career in interior design. He has a unique eye for design, and that's given way to his celebrated work in the buildings of membership clubs and restaurants in New York City. Most recently, Armin has been the producer of a new feature horror film called The Night, starring Shahab Husseini. Armin also stars in the film himself. The plot tells the story of an Iranian couple living in the United States who become imprisoned in an eerie Los Angeles hotel. It is the first American-made film to receive permission for theatrical release in Iran since the Iranian Revolution of 1979. It has just been released in Tehran. And right now, Armin Amiri joins me from Los Angeles today. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. To you. Wow. After that. 
introduction i don't know how to say anything anymore <laughs> uh, this is one, one of the first interviews we're doing on zoom so i can see you and you are looking devilishly handsome looking like the successful actor that you are you know i want to start with this new film the night i mean first of all congratulations yeah. on this this is a film by kurosh ahari uh, and as yes. i mentioned you produced it uh, you're one of the producers you also act in it uh, it was right. just released in theaters in tehran I, I want to get into the story of how that could even happen but first right. of all how do you feel about your film being screened in in your old hometown i mean look i, I to be honest with you i am um, this whole dream started in Iran, right? And, uh, you know, I could sit here and say I left Iran for this reason and that reason. First of all, it was Tenten. I blame Tenten for just ruining my life, wanting to travel. You too, <laughs> huh? You know, we just had we, we, we just had Reza Pakravon on, the, the, the famous explorer, now adventurer. Yes. And he also, yeah. it was Tintin for him. As a kid growing up oh, in Iran, really? it was Tintin. <laughs> Tintin obviously oh. had a huge effect on young Iranian Major. boys major effect on me you know i was the only child and so growing up i grew up in a semi-artistic family and then sort of like different you know i would say i grew up in a family the one side was just like a lot of like status on my mom's side and the other side was my dad which was uh you know not so much on the status and they were just you know ordinary folks and that created so much drama for me <clears throat> growing up uh, seeing the balance and then sort of decide that, you know, I was ready by age 13 to get out of Iran uh, just because I wanted to see the world, you know, like Tintin. Uh, and, and but but and it like Tintin, but also when I was there, really, uh, the people that influenced me was Bruce Lee. You know, I, I, I thought he held the moment so gracefully and full of uh, full of heart that I like that just really was so attractive to me. And then there were other people like, you know, John Travolta, and then later on became Brando, and then, then ultimately was Mickey Rourke for a very long time, because, you know, these are my heroes when I was growing up, you know? Wait so, a minute, Mickey Rourke while you were in Iran? No, Mickey Rourke started That's later. in Turkey. Yeah, I saw yeah. nine and a half weeks. I oh. said, who the heck is this guy in Turkey? You saw and, you saw uh, nine and a half weeks as a kid. As a, uh, you, were, as, you were just a young teenager. I was teenager. 14. I was 14. That's a young age to see that film. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I remember that film. <laughs> I, I was young myself. I think I snuck uh, somehow a copy of it to see it or something, but that's a very provocative <clears throat> film. Uh, so so hang on a second. I asked you a question about how it feels to, to have the night being released in Tehran. Amazing. And, and you went right back to, I mean, this is really, it, in, in some ways, it's like a culmination of this journey for you back to, you know, full circle back to something that you're you're proud of and you've been working on being released in in your home co home country yes and, and and look listen you know for for many years i've lived here and somehow i've always besides try to like be the persian good boy like you know make your your mom proud whatever that that means right still like exists it's like an irish guilt right you have that no matter you know how old you are of course but besides that i also i really was always seeking some sort of a I wouldn't call it validation, but some sort of a, a, a coming together as a team with people that, that, that I love. Like, look, listen, you know, I know Shahab for uh, quite some time now, you know, and uh, I, I, I literally was a fan. I, I thought his work is just just absolutely gorgeous, right? And I work with him, and uh, I just realized that he is who he is because of the work he does. I should just mention that most Iranians will probably know the name uh, Shahab Husseini, but if you don't know who we're talking about, um, if you've seen the film, the Asghar Farhadi film uh, at The Salesman, uh, Shahab was the lead in that and ended up actually winning the uh, Palme d'Or, the Best Actor Award at Cannes for that. He was also in Farhadi's film, A Separation, which he also won an award for, The Silver Bear. I, I guess, I mean, he's one of the Iranian actors at the top of their game right now, right? Absolutely. I, I would say he's one of the best actors I've worked with, besides being Iranian. I hate to put borders on ourselves because we have been so divided on this side, on this whole thing of Iranian and non-Iranian, whatever. I, I think, hands down, he's one of the great actors that I've worked with. And I work with a bunch of great actors. You know, it, it is, in Farsi, it's Shahodom <laughs> Nadere. <laughs> Your parents are still in Iran. Are they going to watch the night in the theater? How, how they are not because they haven't got their vaccine yet. Okay. How do so, they feel uh, about their their son on the screen in in Iran for the first time in a theater there? 
Look, listen, very proud. I, I think it's very touching also because, look, they had to let go of a lot of uh, selfishness in order to let me go, right? To go after what it is that my heart desired. So for that, I have so tremendous amount of, uh, um, I used to have sadness and guilt over it, you know, and I had to get over that by doing a lot of plant medicine work, which we're not going to get there today. But uh, I've got to the place that I understood that, you know, they were the guardian angel who put me through to go after this karmic journey that I have to set for myself. So, uh, you know, I chose them. I'm a huge believer. That's why we go back to taking full responsibility of uh, being here on the planet. Do you send them copies of the, everything you act in? To, I'm sure they're at, they I, ask for it, right? They do. My mom always wants to see the newest thing and, you know, that, 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 that. It's just so lovely. You know, I, I, I'm, you know, it's been 35 years since I've been back to Iran. So uh, I just could only dream, but it's, they say it's nothing like what it used to be. So I still have this fantasy of Iran when I grow up, you know? I'm going to get into your story because it's actually quite a an outstanding and difficult one in terms of how you end up leaving Iran. But uh, let me just stick with the night for a second, because this is sure. a, this film. I mean, I mentioned it in the introduction, the first U.S. made production. So the film was shot in the U.S., right? That yes. is getting release in Iran. This uh, it's a pretty big deal. Uh, with all the limitations and, and censorship in Iran, we've had a few Iranian directors and actors on the show, and they talk about that. I, I'm curious how this came about, how this was possible, how it was possible for Knight to go in to release there. How did the deal come about? I did notice that, for example, um, uh, Nusha Noor, is that how you say her name, the lead the lead actor? Yes, correct. Uh, she's wearing a head covering throughout the, the film. So that, to me, telegraphed that you guys knew this might get shown in Iran while you you were shooting so so you had a deal in place or you hope to have one can you explain how how it came together sure uh, to, to be honest with you how the whole thing came about i get a call from shah he says hey man i'm doing this film we met a couple of times you know uh he was he was very kind to me and i really liked his work as i mentioned before and so we became you know friends and he says hey man uh i'm doing this film i want you to meet with the director and i met with the director and the uh, shahari from the beginning, his vision was like, hey, man, we should be able to make films that is not only, uh, you know, shows here, but it's also we could, you know, make it something for Iran. And I really liked that idea. So I, I thought about it and they asked me if I wanted to be part of the also the, uh, the team to produce it. And uh, it was just the beginning of my uh, company that I have just started. It's called Supernova 8. And I just decided, you know, this is a perfect situation. So I jumped in fully. And I got my hands uh, full with the film. And, you know, we shot the whole thing in Los Angeles in one hotel. It was a beautiful thing come together. But it was what was more beautiful was that we had more success to bring investors with Americans than we had with Persians. Yeah. So, and then not, not to say anything that, you know, that they didn't want to, that maybe they didn't understand the vision, but to say that we're going to make a horror film in Farsi. And then IFC or Apple going to buy it. It was something that it didn't like kind of resonate in the, in, the, in the right way. So kind of in that way, we feel very like, I feel very proud, really proud. How does the deal come together for it to be released in Iran? I mean, how did you, how did you manage so that? We shot the film exactly the same way that we shoot the film in Iran. And for me, it was like the closest thing I could have done to jump in into a, a work that is exactly like working in Iran, because I always envy that. Honestly, I always thought, my God, can you imagine shooting in like north of Iran or or some of like Kurdistan that I have been? It's just beautiful land. So for me, it was just like no brainer. So do you feel like it would have been a different film if you were shooting um, for an American market? I mean, I know this is going to be in a, a global release, yeah. but, you know, knowing that it's going to come out in Iran, there's obvious parameters that you have to kind of put into the creativity, right? Yeah. And I think that's why I have so much respect for those creators in Iran, to be honest with you, John, that they, they're so limited sometimes in telling the narrative, you know, uh, the, with the censorship and the way they have to, to go about it. But they find a way to express it in a totally different way. And I think my conversation with Shahab has been that, you know, we do that in Iran. If there's supposed to be a sexual tension, we don't have to show the, uh, the sexual act. Right. But we could see it in the eye. So I respect them for, for, for what they do. But it would have been a different movie. I mean, if we would have seen her hair throughout the whole thing or we would have seen him kissing or something like that, would have been make it different in the horror genre? I don't think so. I personally don't think so. So, 
You, you mentioned earlier, I want to get into your story and, and this yeah. um, lifelong love of film uh, and being an actor and a producer and this, this kind of where you've got to in this moment with this, um, all these little strands of Armin's life coming together, a film that you're in, that you've helped produce, that's, you know, in Made in America where you live, that's going to be re- released in Iran. It's, it is the culmination in a sense. It's another notch in your, in your dreams. Um, yes. wh- when did you first become enamored of film? Do you remember? I mean, you mentioned Bruce Lee sure. and, and these guys. Was there a moment as a kid where you kind of knew this is what you want to get into? Well, I kind of was always around it as, as, as a boy, right? So because my mom was a lovely lady and she was, uh, wanted to try acting. And uh, my dad was a makeup artist and a hairdresser. And uh, that's how they met. And he, you know, became a, you know, typical Iranian man says that you can't be an actor, so that's not going to work out. All that good stuff. And um, so, but they had a lot of colorful friends and musicians and actors and all that. So I was kind of like around it as a young child. And you know how Persian uh, parties were. Uh, you probably remember the kids slept on the couch like until five in the morning and they were just dancing around and drinking and having a good time. So that was, that was like how I grew up. But then um, when the revolution happened, my dad was no longer able to do what he did, which he was very, actually, he was like one of, like, he was like Frederick Frakai of Iran at that time. So he he did makeup in film. He did makeup in film, but he also had his own, like, a a salon or whatever you want to call Uh it, that people came in to get the the latest haircut. And he was that guy. He was like shampoo. He was all like Warren (laughs) Warren Beatty. Beatty. Yeah, okay. (laughs) Yeah, he was all Warren Beatty. He had the same car. He was really feeling himself, you know? And uh, so he meets my mom and he falls in love and, you know, the rest is history. But Although it's, it's, it's a bit sad that he worked in film and yet he wouldn't let your mom uh, uh, be yes. uh, fulfill her acting dreams. Well, to, to, to his, not credit, but to what he says at the time, our movie industry for women was nothing but just, a, you know, a, a bad place. Mm. You know, like just, just women were passed around, you know in order to to be able to become stars in Iran. I don't know, I wasn't there, I, I wanna believe him. I think his ego has a lot to do with it. Who knows? Right. Uh, but after the revolution, uh, uh, he, he was forced to find different jobs. And one of the jobs that he got into was that he opened up video clubs. So before everything, there was this thing, a phenomena in Iran, everybody had like video uh, uh, machines and uh, he was renting videos and he had like two, three of them in different part of Tehran. So I was watching films like three times a day, like huh. six hours a day, just wow. crazy. Yeah. So that was the, that was, that was the beginning of, of love affair with, with films, you know? So, I mean, why, why did your family, why did you leave Iran? It, it, it's a strange time that you left Iran because I find that for the most part of the people who we find in the diaspora, they've either come recently, uh, like IE in the last 10 or even 20 years, or mm-hmm. they came uh, right when the revolution was happening, you know, let's get the hell out of here, or like my family, well before the revolution. Um, you guys, it's sort of into the 1980s, you're already in Iran, you've you've overcome the, the, the shock or the whatever, the experience of being there for Interim the revolution. Interim government. Yeah. Oh. So so how, how, how is it that you elect to leave? Look, I was growing faster than usual. Uh, I, I was I was a young young kid that uh, most of my friends were older than me, and uh, I was the only child, so I was uh, observing a lot of like you know older sort of like you know vibrations and all that. And uh, I always knew I wanted more, and especially watching films and like look, listen, it was a period of the time that break dancing was the only thing I thought about from the morning to night. Break dancing. Break dancing, yeah. I used to break dance really well. In so, Iran. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Post post so, revolution was was break dancing not haram? Was it was it okay to break dance? Oh yeah, we used to like you know gang up and like you know just go and put like you know p- cardboards and like in you know, a boom box and just actually, you know, like right. get into it. All right. Yeah, yeah. Lights on. We had the full thing going on and I was like fully immersed into okay. it. You know, it was like uh, so, but uh, so when does the yen? You're, you're growing faster than others. You're. Uh, yeah, I was you're, growing you... faster than others, exactly. And I was having some difficulties in school, 
I, it was an incident that sort of, I feel like that shook my parents to the place. It's like, hey man, we don't have that much money, but for whatever we got, let's see if this kid, wherever he goes, let's send him off. You know what I mean? Because it really was my desire, you know? Mm. And uh, I, I got beat up in school when I was uh, 10 years old, 11, 11. Uh, it was kind of a time was just like, it was getting a, I don't know, people, when we went through the interim government and afterwards, there were so many waves that I felt like that I was at the point in my life that I just wanted to experience something different. So I asked my parents, I said, could you guys help me to go to America? And to, to be honest, my, 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 my dad didn't have that kind of, uh, you know, financial like security to, to do that. But he says, you know, we could go to Turkey and see what happens from there. So, um, uh, I mean, this is going to just say it's quite extraordinary. You're 12, 13 years old. And yeah. and I mean, that's a bold move for a 13 year old. I would have been way too intimidated to say, I want to go to the other side of the world. I'm ready to go. Yeah, I mean, that's that's impressive in the sense that you knew yourself well enough to think you could pull that off. Yeah, there was something was pulling me, John. You know, there was something was bigger than me. You have this desire to leave. I guess your parents respected the fact that they, or they saw something in you that this kid is not made for, uh, who was it? We had a guest who, I think maybe it was Picasso, uh, Moini, who said, you know, I just realized I'm not made to be in Iran. I'm, uh, so mm. he, he left and went to Germany, you know, as a kid. But there's something about you that they, they would, I, mean, I guess, I'm guessing, really saw and said, okay, we have to help get this kid out of here. So you go to I Turkey, so. but then what happens over the next few years? I mean, if I got this correct, let me read this out. You, got, you go to Turkey first, then you go to Bulgaria, then you go to Yugoslavia, then you're in Vienna for around three years. You're a teenage kid by yourself seeking asylum. I mean, this, this suggests you really wanted to avoid returning to Iran. Uh, uh, what, what, what is a 14-year-old kid thinking who's by himself in places in Bulgaria and Vienna and trying to desperately get to America? I, I so uh, look watching Michael Jackson, for example, right? Just absolutely being in love with with, with him. It was more than just loving him. I, my whole thing was that what do they feed these guys over there that they get to become these guys, uh. right? Because I feel like there are mindset in Iran at the time was just not allowing for things to grow to be individual. And I think that within my spirit, right, just, just talking about my own spirit in my own life, I cannot be put in a situation that I have to act like everyone else. Mm. And once that happens, it could be in a relationship, it could be in a friendship or whatever it is. When that expectation comes towards me, I'm right out the door. And there's nothing I could do. That's just, that's just my calling. So I think that's that's one of the reasons. Um, they, my mom, uh, in Farsi, we say, uh, you have a, a sad kishi. He's, he's got, he's got, his, his, his mind is just like, you know, he's a dreamer, yeah. basically. I was yeah. a dreamer, yeah. But you were a dreamer, uh, enough of a dreamer that you would leave. I'm assuming you had friends in Iran. You, you, you had your family in Iran. You had a home in Iran. Um, it's um, I, I kind of I've got to say I kind of love it. I mean, I love that the bravery, but uh, it's it's the stuff that movies are made of. But it's like you again, you see that Michael Jackson, you see that sort of vision and go, I want to go to a place where I can become him. By the way, an African American <laughs> uh, yeah. pop star, you know, an, an Iranian kid dreaming of being him. I mean, it's a it's it's fascinating on a hundred different levels. <laughs> But that draw for you, that incentive for you, being as strong as it was, uh, is is very interesting. Did you uh, just? I want to. I'm going to come back to Michael Jackson actually. But but when you get to America, did it actually feel like what you had hoped it would feel like? In other words, do you land and go, "I'm home. This is where I need. To, I'm supposed to be." Not in the first glance, because it was in Michigan for about four months. Uh, and I was just like, I came from Vienna and I was doing really well, like meaning like I was going out and people knew me and I had a whole thing going on. And then you arrived in Vienna and if you had a long hair, they will call you names. It was just uh, you know, in, in Michigan. So I, I was just like, so I, I moved to San Francisco, but you know, it was interesting when I arrived to San Francisco, I experienced something that I would not change it for the world. 
And that was that I feel like I experienced that hate and Ashbury uh, moments again in the early 90s because the house music was just coming into San Francisco from like Ireland and Chicago. And they were doing things like the full moon parties under the Golden Gate Bridge with like fire pits, like the beginning at the beginning. And I was able to experience that with a lot, a lot of psychedelics and a lot of great experiences feeling like I was back in that time. Right. So, um, yeah. Interesting. You know, um, there's a story. I don't want to leave this journey yet uh, through Europe because, I, I, first of all, I want to ask you in those years, so from when you're 13 to when you're about 18 and you finally make it to the U.S., um, I mean, you just, this is not the average middle class uh, teenage experience that most people listening, no matter where they are in the world, would be able to relate to. Most of us were in high school, you know, right. our, the hardest thing we were dealing with was somebody teasing us or, you know, the girl you like doesn't like you back or, or, or I'm having trouble in math class or I wish my nose wasn't so big. You are moving from country to country, getting robbed, getting arrested. Uh, what would you say the hardest part of that period of your life was? The split from uh, mom uh, and to this day, I think has left a quite a trauma uh, of saying goodbye. We tried that a couple of times. It was the toughest thing that I could have experienced to this day to say goodbye and not knowing that when you're going to see that person again. So I think, I, I think, I think if that is the one, the rest of it is just the, uh, you know, Hey, the life has thrown me so many great, beautiful things. But when I look back, if there was one thing that I would regret the most is that not spending enough time with her. So when, when was that goodbye, Armin? It was after a year in Turkey. My my dad set me down and he says, look, listen, you know, I don't have any more money left, right? And uh, he says, we, we want to go back. I mean, it was just, just very level-headed. The first time, I think, first really honest conversation because I I, I, I had a, not a very colorful relationship with my dad. And I'm very you know, honest about it. I don't, yeah. I don't, I don't have to sugarcoat it. But at this moment, was very level. He goes like, I got this much money left. I could send you off with these people, this con man. A smuggler. To, to you. With a smuggler, yeah. 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 So, you know, that's that's when he said that to me. And then me and my mom had to prepare ourselves to say goodbye. And then it was like them taking me to the bus, to sit on that bus. The first time we couldn't actually make it happen because we both were crying so much. So we lost a little money, but we decided to come back the next 10 days. And this time... I remember I had no emotion. I just looked at her. They waved, we waved, and the bus took off. And I think for the longest time, maybe some of the uh, uh, the anger issues and some of the stuff that has come up for me now that I've gotten older is that I've never fully dealt with that uh, tragedy in, in, in a level-headed way. So Your parents haven't visited you in the States, huh? No, no, no. We didn't see each other for 18 years. Huh. And uh, so, and you know, and then they, they, they just were living their lives and you know, they got older. And then they came out here a couple of times. I, I took them to uh, Thailand. Um, we had a great time. I've seen them maybe since then, maybe six, seven times altogether. It's such an interesting response. You know, when asked what was, what was the most difficult part, because I know a little bit about your story and I know that some of what you went through is the stuff of a horror story, uh, the jail or the what, whatever, and, and, and that you would choose the severing of that moment of you and your mom uh, leaving each other. And, and uh, I, I, can, I respect that and I understand it. And I can, I can only imagine that thinking about it still makes you emotional. Yeah, uh, it is. And, you know, but we, we got off and, you know, I you know, went through a couple of different places, ended up, you know, in the refugee camp. Uh, was introduced to to a very tough guy in a refugee camp to uh, to be a, you know to be introduced in the camp. So then the life began. You know, you, but, you know, um, you, you know that the the cliche question to ask, although I feel I feel like I need to ask it, is how do you feel like that period of your life formed you? In in other words, we are the amalgamation of our experiences so what did Armin going through what you went through in those teenage years the refugee camps the leaving your mom what how did that inform who you've become good question uh can I answer it in a different way and answer it however you want okay and this is just this is this is just actually for 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 for, for collective consciousness for, for all of us and I'm just going to put it out there right 
if someone would have asked me uh, when I was 13 years old that uh, if you leave Iran and you climb mountains and you live in Turkey and you're going to say goodbye to old grandma and you will never see the favorite grandma ever again and that are uncles and friends and da 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 and your parents. But when you get to the refugee camp and you go through the, uh, the, the quarantine, after three months, when you come down, you get to meet Michael Jackson. Would you do this? Would you do this? And the kid would say, no. No fucking way. Excuse my language, sorry. Apologize. Uh, no way, right? And so what that has made me realize is that the heavy lifting is up to the universe. It's not up to us. So when I look back to, to answer you this way is that, wow, the imagination of that kid, man, the imagination of that kid, it's something to admire. And I have lost that kid for a very long time, to be honest with you. And I think the journey is being going back to that uh, fearless kid that envisions is nothing going to get in the head by just actually receiving and getting there. That's 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 a gift, man, and that's that that that's that's talent. I want to give back to that kid. I really do. I think I think he had he had a lot of potential. I, yeah. I, I you know, I read about somewhere I read you you had told the story at some point of the Michael Jackson. Yeah, I th let me see if I have this right. You're in a you're in the refugee camp. You're in Vienna, I think. And you hear that Michael Jackson <laughs> is in town right and yeah. and and for some reason you don't have a ticket or something but you just go to no this, money and you have no money and and you but you but this he is your idol he is yeah. your guy so what yeah. happens tell the story well i come down from quarantine after three months this is my favorite story of my life by the way okay i'm not gonna i'm not gonna be shy about it i'm gonna how, put it out how, there. how old were you uh, 14 now, 14, okay. 14 and a couple of months, I would say. Um, I'm sitting down on a, on a, on a, on a table, you know, it was like, it just got my refugee card that I can't leave the camp. It was a red and yellow one. I stood in there and I see some, uh, some refugee, uh, Hungarians are speaking, but they keep saying Michael Jackson. So I said, Hey, I speak a little English and what's happening with this dude. And they said, he's coming to town. And I was just like, wow, when it goes like tomorrow. I was like, oh, wow. So what I did was that I left really early. And back in the days, if we would jump on the trains, the train, the ticket collector will come. And if you didn't have it, they would throw you out. So that happened to me about like four or five times until I was able to arrive. And uh, Kim Wilde was opening for him, <laughs> which, uh, you know, not that many people had. They have to be my age to remember there was a Kim Wilde. I remember Kim Wilde, yeah. Yeah, okay. And everyone was chanting, Michael, Michael. And I was just standing there and my tears were coming down. Not because I can't go in. There was this poor guy can go in. It was more like, oh my goodness, I am, you know, breathing the same air that Michael is breathing. You know, I was like, that's what I was crying for, you know? And all the gates starts closing and one of them right in front of me didn't fully close and two securities were smoking a cigarette. Like Midnight Express, I just put my head down and I started walking and no one stopped me, right? So no one stops me. I go to the second row behind this guy who's holding on to his girlfriend and on his shoulder. Wait a minute. You, 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 you run into the stadium. Yeah, uh, I go into the Sephora line, you, right? And in the you front. go right to the floor or you go right to the, the where the stage is. You go where the stage is beside this girl, <laughs> like on top of her boyfriend. And Michael Jackson comes with the, with the air balloon. He jumps out of the air balloon with the wolf mask. Everything I have asked for. He spins and he points at me and he says, "Get the me thriller, whatever." Right? And I'm like, and I'm like, look into this thing. And she drops. She passes out. So the security come and take her away. The girl, the girl next to you. The girl on top of her boyfriend passes out. So I'm now in front of the stage, and Michael is actually performing for me. So the <laughs> Willy Wonka and the golden ticket, or whatever that was, the kid really got it. You know, so it was it was it was great. Do you really think Michael was pointing at you, or was he maybe pointing to about a thousand? Because people? he was in the center. I was in the center. <laughs> I knew to get myself, so he was just pointing in the center. It was a mirror. I like how I, I'm glad in, it in your me. remembrance of the story, he pointed right at you as he was singing thriller but that's fine I, I i i think that should be the story so you're this i mean in a way experiences like that were like making it all worthwhile 
they were saying like, hey, you know, follow the dots, right? I think this as, is as meant kid, to be. The, yeah, <laughs> I mean, I was following a lot of stuff. Yeah. Armin, you, you, you end up, you do get to America. You study acting, you make it to New York, in fact, after your stint in Michigan and uh, the West Coast and your time with the psychedelics. Uh, you run into a snag uh, once you start getting into acting. You said that you didn't want to play the roles of Middle Eastern terrorists. And for the most part, those were the roles that were available to you at the time. And, and that's why you end up starting to get into other things like interior design. Tell me about the kinds of roles that, that you were getting and the typecasting. Look, before the war uh, that happened with Iraq, um, obviously I was getting a lot of like Latinos and a lot of like, you know, uh, Cubans and this and that. And, you know, it, it wasn't, you know, this full fledged of like Middle East. So you mean the Gulf War. War? You mean the American War with Iraq, not the Iran Iraq War? 2000, was, yeah, after, right. after, after, literally after the Afghanistan War. Right. Like right. when Two, Afghanistan happened, it was early 2000s, post 9 11. Yeah. 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 Post 9 11. Yeah. Exactly. And uh, I just was like coming out of a, you know, I, I studied. So this is the deal. I didn't have a green card for so many years. So I wasn't able to go to like, let's say four years conservatories. Like I got accepted to Stella Adler, but I couldn't do it. I had to still work. They're like, no, you have to take off two years. I'm like, how am I going to pay the rent? So it was always about how I'm going to pay the rent and how I'm going to study, right? And um, it got to the place that um, I went to active studio. I studied with a, a woman named Sandra Seacat who taught Mickey work, worked with Al Pacino. She's been a member for a long time. I was introduced to Susan Batson who um, worked with Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman and Julia Binoche. These people were in my class. So I was exposed to some like great, you know, people just, just being in these classes and I worked really hard. And then I got with an agency, very legitimate agency. I don't need to name it. And they just went to town by sending me out on like every like Muhammad and Atas, right? <laughs> and I'm cool with that. But it, it, then it was just getting a little too much. And the feedbacks that I was getting, it was like outright racist right. in, 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 in ways. You're not, or, or look like the people that's supposed to look like, oh, you look Latino or you like, you know, this and that. And I just felt like, oh my goodness. So I decided. Yeah. Oh, oh, I love that one. That's the one where they say, we want you to play a, a terrorist, but even though you're Iranian, you don't look enough <laughs> Like our vision yeah. of a of a terrorist, yeah. right? Yeah. And that that war, to be honest with you, John, is is the media war, um, which which is, is it's 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 getting easier, but we get there. We're gonna. I, I really want to stress that there. This is really important. What's happening to the to the Middle Eastern actors? But uh, you know, it, it was a time that CIA wanted to make aliens look back to everyone. Make them look like horrible, gooey things that they want to bite you. They want to take you away to a different planet. And they did a good job, the PR job, to make him look bad. Right sure. now, the PR job on an Iranian or Middle Eastern men, it has been a quite a, a, a tough one, right? Yep. And uh, and so I feel like that I have battled that for the past 20 years. And I decided at one point, it's like, you know what? I'm going to do art house films, but I'm going to go design and do that. So I don't have to deal with that limitation that you're putting on me. And so I feel like the limitation is lifting, but it's not there yet, but it's so much better than 20 years ago for sure. So, you know, this is a tough conversation. It's one that I've had with a, uh, a few of our guests because it's obviously very, very important. And, and uh, I, it really isn't, it's hard to break this down in sort of rigid black and white ways. I mean, I know that there are some well-known Iranians who have said, I will not play a terrorist. And there's others who will say, I'll take whatever gig it is. But in the kind of conversations mm. I've had with, I'm sure folks, you know, uh, Azi Takani Zada or, or Navid Degapan, you know, oh, yeah, Navid, yeah. Navid I mean, well, he, he is great. And he has played some terrorist like characters. And, and yes. so on the one hand, part of me wants to go, dude, you shouldn't be playing those characters or, you know, let's not uh, underscore stereotypes. But on the other hand, I think, the fuck am I to be asking, telling this guy, you know, this guy's working. This is, a, this is a guy who came here and drove a cab for a while and is a great oh, yeah. actor and is taking the roles he, he needs to take to make a living. Who, who is anybody Absolutely. to say, don't take I, that gig? So it's a difficult road to walk, right, to navigate. It is. It really is. Look, for me, I feel like that I was fully protected from my guardian angels in a, in a lot of ways. Even the ones, there's not one film or one TV series 
that I could look, that I say I was in talks with, or they wanted me, or it didn't happen, or whatever, that I would regret not being in it, mm. or has done so much for another person. Mm -hmm. And this is what was created. Look, if you look at the black community, they have each other's back, right? Persian community, because we came in and it feels like, who's going to be able to grab the fruit first? And I think that mentality is easing down for, for all of us. So we're not, we don't always have to be in the competition for, with one another and be genuinely happy because if uh, so-and-so is doing great, it means that there's so much opportunity that is opening up for everyone. And I think that mentality, sort of the old sort of mentality is changing as well. I think that's, that's part of the culture. You know, everyone's looking for it. It's a you know, gold rush. Everyone's looking for gold. But then I think once you have a couple of gold, you take it easy. I, I, should, that's what's I should mention, because I brought up his name, one of the things that Navi does say is he says, I will always, I'll take some of those roles, but I will play the character as a human being with nuance. Yes. This is a person, yes. not just a cut out cardboard character, which I have so much respect for. The guy, you know, when he's playing the terrorist on Homeland, he says, look at that character I'm playing and you see a human being, a conflicted, a difficult, maybe a wrong human being, but a human being. And, and that's, that's part of what he brings to it. Uh, the other thing I was Amen. Say, yeah, Amen. Right. That's all you could do, man. Sometimes you get into set, you could even say yes to a project. By the time you get to the set, you meet the people and their agendas. You realize, oh, I signed up for a whole wrong different ball game here. Well, and I was then, gonna, I was well, gonna say, Armin, I mean, you even in the roles you have taken. Um, I, maybe I haven't seen all of them, but I've, I've watched a few of your films and the lead up to this interview, and I really enjoyed it. Um, you, you do play you play a non-white guy. You play immigrants. You play uh, in some cases. You know, if we're holding the standard as Persian actors should only play a Tahsil Kadim Aruf Persian oh, guy or no, something, you're no. not going to get gigs, right? <laughs> like, no, so it's not even gigs. It's just that, like, what story you want to tell? Is it fun? Look, I just this this work I just did in uh, up in the mountains in, in, in Nevada. It, you know, it, it, sometimes you do things because it's really got a calling on it. And uh, I, I, look, beside the fact that we're we're talking about actors and the choices, I think the most important thing is: is are you having a platform that you are happy to get up on a Sunday and do it? And you're happy to, to to be a part of it any day of the week. So I think that that's the case is then you're happy. You know, I want that. Uh, to me to look to say, hey, man, from acting, or I could sit down here and have an interview with you and there will be another thousand people that are going to become aware of me and what I do. It's a blessing, right, for where I come from. It's a blessing. And I, and I lost that way for a long time, Jim, and I'm getting back to it. It's the, uh, you know, being thankful, being grateful for what's about to come. Hmm. Because if that's the case, is the present moment becomes more pleasant to deal with. What changed that you became, uh, you realized you wanted to be grateful? I mean, I've, I've done a lot of ayahuasca work. Oh. That's a different subject. Oh, yeah. wow. Yes. Okay. A lot yeah. of ayahuasca. A lot. Like more than one or two or three times. About 20 times. <laughs> Actually, exactly 20. Dude, that scares me. Really? Yeah, uh, uh, okay. and so it was. It was great. It was the greatest love I have ever experienced. To be honest with you, wow. mother's love and this love and women's okay. love. But where do you go to do ayahuasca? Peru. I have worked with these shamans who there were scientists before from Germany and a friend of mine from New York. They've lived in Peru, and uh, instead of drinking the whole, uh, 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 you know, chunk of it, what you do is that they have divided the DMT from the brew. And so you do two shots after 10 or 15 minutes of each and they connect and then you have uh, you know the experience and it really works for you you don't get sick and freak out you want to get sick the whole thing about sickness i think is is, is this thing misconceptions that people have is that they don't want to get sick in front of people but what it is that you don't throw up food you're actually just releasing what's been holding on to you for generations sometimes. Wow. Whether it's a karmic things or whatever. So it actually is, is, is in the form of a liquid, but it's actually leaving your body. So afterwards, you feel very, very loose and very great about it. You know? So you want to get sick if that's what you want to But you're, you're not, anyway. when you say you've done it 20 times, you're not supposed to do it too often, right? So you. You are actually. You, and you, you are supposed, you're supposed to do it. To do, 
you're supposed to do three or four to five times at the very first, like every day, because then you could clear up and get to the to the karmic, uh, gen- uh, genetic karmic stuff, which is, you know, different conversation. There's some Persian mom or dad listening somewhere that's going to be writing a very angry letter saying, uh, our kid wants to do ayahuasca now because uh, Armin no, said but, it was... But, but uh, uh, to, to just to just defend it, not to defend it, but to just be, be, be you know, very lucid about it is that you know, the Freudian concept of that you could actually, uh, by talking, you could heal a part of your right, life, right. Is, I, I think is a total fallacy because what you're doing, you're creating more of that. So if you even go with the Buddhist concept of, of samsara, which is creating the same experience that you have, but this time you make a different decision because you're more aware. And I feel like that with psychedelic or I would say ayahuasca, you have an a moment to be able to experience that again and this time release it for good. So I feel like the psychedelic works better than therapy, talk therapy. But well, anyway. I mean, looking at you, you look great. So that you're a good spokesperson for it so far. Anyway, uh, call me one eight hundred nine 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 ayahuasca one eight hundred ayahuasca armyda ayahuasca dot com. Uh, I want to ask you about this. Um, uh, I'll come back to your acting before we end off. But, but this um, stint you've had as a successful interior designer. I mean, you've designed very well known spaces, clubs, restaurants in New York City, like Socialista, Mister H. Uh, that sounds like a successful life. First of all, uh, I, I know that when you were a little disenchanted with acting and you wanted to pay the bills, you were spending mornings designing and then being a doorman at ultra exclusive clubs at night, uh, which sounds both ambitious and, and potentially unhealthy as a lifestyle in terms of all that you yes. were doing. Um, but how did you understand this facility for design? How did you become this successful designer? So when I grew up in Iran, my, my grandparents, they always bought stuff from Europe. Uh, and I grew up with the 50s and 60s. I have a great understanding of that time, the Art Deco, really, 40s, 50s, 60s, just in me. And uh, I was, you know, I was running a place and I did this film called The Factory Girl. And afterwards, it's like, I don't want to be at the front door working with people, which was fun. It was the, one of the greatest fun that I had outside, like just dealing with people in general, right? Just from Bill Clinton's to like, you know. You were the person who decides who gets in? Is that you? I was the person who decides who gets in. And I didn't have a green card. So I was letting, like, not letting people in that I think I could have just kicked my ass out. You're not the bouncer. You're not the big bouncer guy. You're the guy with I the- wasn't a big bouncer. I was the guy that basically just whether, you know, made your night or ruined your night, basically. That's a lot of power. I always envy those guys, the guy like you, who's standing, you yeah. know, and that you want to impress your date or you come to the place and, and the guy like and you says, not you, pal. Sorry, Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Look, listen, I've seen relationships end in front of me. I tell you a quick story to just for the fun part. Right. I had a, a wedding happen that five people came in. It was winter, winter, snow on the ground, wind is blowing in New York. And they said, hey, is our wedding? Could we come in? And we had a full on like guest list. I said, sorry, guys, happy, you know, uh, congratulations. There's nothing I could do. Just being nice about it. She's like, I have a friend in there, the, the, the bride. I said, you know what I could do? I could let you in, go get her. But I'm sorry, I can't take care of you. She goes in, half hour, 45, an hour. I go in, she's doing shots after shots with friends, and totally I forgot about her like her, husband. Her group. Just right, right, right. So, I mean, I have seen people split up in that kind of thing in the category. Yeah. <laughs> Did you have Persian guys like trying to grease your palm? Like, uh, battle that, let me, brother, let me, let me give you, let me give you uh, 200, Mark 200 bucks. Cuban tried to grease me, and <laughs> well, uh, we, we, we had a, we had a, we had a full on thing about that. Mark Cuban doesn't get in because he's Mark Cuban. For me, no. Uh, he was. <laughs> uh, so it's too much power. It's too much power. I'm glad. Was, I'm, I'm glad that you have the successful acting career, producing, and all that at this point. But, but I, I, there's something. I'm still enamored of the doorman or those people oh, with the or women who have the list. And Bill make, Clinton told me he wanted to be a doorman. I said, why? He's like, I always wanted to be a doorman at Plaza because I thought that I could meet really interesting people. By the way, I'm assuming you let Bill Clinton in. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you didn't leave him waiting outside. 
with the groom no. uh, as the no. bride. And I needed my green card, so I was just really <laughs> trying hard to get to one of his people to take care of me. <laughs> uh, you you get what might be called your big break. You mentioned Factory Girl, a film that you yes. were in, but you get kind of the big break is this film called The Wrestler, which I is is such an incredible film, and I, I actually had the chance to interview Darren Aronofsky when that film came out, and he's such an interesting person and a, a creative wild big break. person. How did your relationship with Mickey Rourke and the director Darren Aronofsky begin? Um, to be honest with you, uh, I met Mickey. That was always like a, a, through a friend uh, that we have, and uh, we started hanging out. And you know, I just found him. Just you know, first of all, I was a huge fan, right? So like uh, nine and a half weeks. Sorry, uh, the other one, Angel Heart. I watched twenty-seven times straight. Like you know, like it was my favorite word. And so I got to know him and we became really good, good friends. And he called me up. He says, hey, man, I'm, I'm doing this film called The Wrestler. And I want you to meet Darren. And so I met with Darren. And, you know, Darren, just, as you met, very interesting guy, brainy. We, we chatted. And, and, then and by the way, was, this, this was a comeback, a big comeback for Mickey Rourke himself. Because he yes. was sort of out of it, you know. And the, the, the wrestler was his huge return, you know. Then City as well. Sin City, Sin City, I thought, right. yeah, yeah. gave him a good little yeah, yeah, yeah. bump up, you yeah. know. It was great as Marv. But you probably had no idea this was going to end up being as big a film as it, uh, you know. I Oscar. did, and i tell you about it. He wasn't going to be, they couldn't insure Mickey. So they went with, uh, what's the guy's name from uh, Fear and Load in Las Vegas? Nicholas Cage. Nicholas Cage, yeah, Nick Cage. It became Nicholas Cage, and then uh, Nicholas Cage didn't work out, and then Mickey came back on, and we ended up doing the film. Uh, which to me was just like, come on, I'm, I'm like with my hero, I'm, I'm doing a scene, and then it's Darren Aronofsky. It's like if anybody, like I feel like that it was just like such a another great little gift from the universe. You know, the work was great. I never forget. I was standing outside of the door, getting prepared to do the scene, and Mickey comes, hey, come on, let's go smoke a cigarette, have some coffee. I said, no, no, no I'm just going to stay. He said, what are you, method actor? You're just trying to keep it yourself. He's like, good luck to you. I'm going to smoke you. And he was like, he brought that sort of like, you know, I don't care who you are. You want to steal the scene. And he has that mentality. It's about stealing the scene. And I don't believe that so much. I think it's really about working together. But it was it was a great experience. The rest of it was great. Does being in a film that's that big, I mean, you seem to now get a lot of gigs. Uh, I mentioned a few of them, NCIS. You're, you, you turn up in different places on television and in film. Does being in a film like... Uh, uh, the wrestler is it a game changer? Do you suddenly are you suddenly on the radar in a way that you wouldn't you weren't before? I think it's all about your agent, and so if your agent is doing the job, I think you're 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 set. If the agent is not doing the job, I, th I think you have a you have a lot of problems. So um, I, I you know during the wrestler I could have probably garnished more, but it was it was what it was. You know I I don't know. I, every time I feel like I've done something that's going to make it different, it really does it. I feel like when you look back, when I look back, I see a nice little selection of, of, of gigs. But in front of me, I feel like I would like to get more, to be honest with you. You know, like that. That's clear because you're working on a number of projects simultaneously. You're now writing and producing as well. You're, you've been directing, you're, you're acting, you're, you still do design, you do a, you, you've got a lot. What is it that makes you want to do so much? You're, you're energetic, you're enthusiastic, you're clearly ambitious. What drives you at this stage? At this stage is to follow what heart desires. And letting go of the mind use the mind in order to create the colors that you want to create but to me it's about you know what can i do to help so for example um on monday i'm going down by the border uh with the reporter and we're just trying to cover what's happening at the border with people who've been there seeking asylum for the past two and a half years that's a very very important thing that's that that's what is going to move me from here on i've decided to really fully help the refugee causes because I was one and I know how it feels. Mm. So I could, if I bring a little light of hope to those people's lives, then I've done my job. The acting stuff, it comes and goes, you know. Honestly, 10 years from now, 15 years from now, I'm, you wouldn't want to have this conversation with me, right? I could be just like, just gone and 
So why put so much stock on something what, that? What are you talking uh, about? You're gone it's, where? It's fleeting. Uh, Ten years from now, you won't be. What, what do you mean? I mean, who knows what happens, right? I could die. I could, I could exit the planet. I could not want to act. Well, if you keep but, doing but, ayahuasca every week, that might happen. But otherwise, I, <laughs> you're, you're a healthy guy. But listen, it's a short cup of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm trying to say is that you don't take any right. stuff with you. Right, right. That's all. By the way, in, in you know, before we end off, just in terms of the experiences of Armin Amiri, uh, does being in in um, the wrestler with Mickey Rourke, uh, what's what's higher on the list? Being in the in the wrestler Reading with Al Pacino. How be, about that? Being in the wrestler with Mickey Rourke. I'll get to that. Or Michael Jackson pointing at you in, uh, as a 14-year-old. Oh, they're both for big dreams. Man. Ayahuasca or Michael Jackson pointing at you as a 14-year-old? Ayahuasca. Oh, ayahuasca beats Michael Jackson? Beats all of them. i tell you why. 1-800. No, 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 no. Forget about, forget about promoting this, this thing. Right. I'm talking about the lights. Okay. If we, I think we all go back to the light, the worst of us. And if you could see the light and experience the light, you understand everything just dissolves around us. So I think as a human being, we're fully are in our rights to go back to the light. Now, how we come back and continue this journey of ours to graduate is a different story. But going back, exiting after here, we all go into the light. But that's what ayahuasca has given me, to be able to see and experience the light. So, you know, nothing can beat the light. I, for me, the Michael Jackson is still up there. Of course, your Michael Jackson is Bowie, <laughs> David Bowie for me. And, and I swear he pointed at me in 1990 when I was there. But uh, but uh, uh, before I let you go, um, yes. I, there's a new film that you're directing called Albert that has Max Amini as the lead, our buddy Max. What's, Correct. What is this about? Sorry, I'm laughing because it's a funny story. I am hoping in my, you know, ambitious mind that we could do, get this thing rolling in exactly two months from now, 60 days from now. Okay. I'm directing my first directorial. We'll be it's, shooting it like it's Rumble Fish meeting uh, 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 Roma. It's black and white. And uh, Max is going to play a very colorful character named Albert who lives with his mother. And uh, I, for me, is a throwback to being there um, with Peter Sellers. Wow. Uh, throwback to those kind of, uh, just to be able to experience uh, uh, the, a man's journey. I'm really interested in that kind of stories, you know. So, um, yeah, I'm really excited. Is it a comedy? It's not. It's like Paul Thomas Anderson type of comedy. Okay. It's dark. It's dark and, and well, it sounds interesting. Yeah. Can't wait. Really excited. It's been a pleasure talking to you. I, I'm uh, I'm grateful for your time. I'm uh, really happy to see you, although I look forward to doing so in person post-COVID uh, you know, Same lockdowns. And, uh, and, and I've been a big fan. Before we go, I have to say, I've been a big fan of yours for many years since East Coast. So I just want to put that out there to you. And this is such an honor and pleasure. To Are you saying to you. that when you were a doorman, I would have been able to get in? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I made the cut. Thank God I made the cut. Uh, <laughs> hey, congratulations on this new film, The Night. Uh, I do it, recommend yeah. once it's uh, – is it going to be on uh, for in North America? I mean, where, I mean, people are listening around the world, but wh wh where will people be able to see it? The Night is right now in iTunes. It was on Apple. It's on okay. IFC Midnight. And okay. we started two days ago in Tehran and uh, also in uh, the little towns outside of Iran. Well, there's Tehran, people so. who are listening in Iran who will be able to see it, uh, I hope, uh, uh, but uh, and everybody else should run to iTunes and check it out. It's a very interesting film and see our buddy uh, Armin in it as well. Thank you for this, my brother. Thank you very much. Khodafiz. Ciao. Armin Amiri, an Iranian-American actor, producer, interior designer. His latest film is called The Night, in which he is one of the stars and a producer of the film. It has just gone into release in Iran as the first American-produced film to be released in Iran since 1979. Armin Amiri joined us from Los Angeles today.
See, I told you he was a charming guy. <laughs> I told right. you guys. Uh, the uh, microphones are back on. Groovy Shia, Captain Reza, uh, the fabulous Keon. Um, yeah, there you go. That's right. our, our mean, uh, full of energy. No, you're right. You're 100% right. Bundle of energy. I wonder how much of that energy comes from that ayahuasca experiences that this guy has gone through like 20 times. Well, I don't know if, uh, yeah, but I mean, he seemed to, <laughs> uh, yeah, he, uh, he certainly ascribes a lot of uh, um, credit to yeah. ayahuasca, I think. I don't know. I, I should point out that some people really don't believe it's a good That's idea right, to do ayahuasca. Yeah. Uh, and others swear by it. I have, a, you know, I know other friends who've done it. Keon, you're nodding. Some have you done them, ayahuasca? No, oh. I, I, I've, it's been, on, it's on my list, but mm. I've been told you have to be ready to take it. Yeah. I mean, my reason is I've, I've known so many successful people that have just figured out their life and they swear by ayahuasca. That's the reason wow. they cre credit to. Right. Um, but they tell you, you have to be ready. You see yourself mm. for better and for worse. And mm. it kind of makes your path more lightened. I, I credit guess. eye calendar. You can just use a calendar <laughs> to help organize your life. You don't need ayahuasca. But uh, Well, you organize. have your life figured out, Gian. Some <laughs> yeah, of us right. don't. It's all figured out. <laughs> well, I, uh, yeah, okay. Anyway, I mean, there's other things to talk about with Ar Armin as well, uh, including the fact that um, we just uh, turned it off, but that was the first time we've actually shot a full interview. That's right. And uh, so, uh, Captain Reza, you're going to take that. and, and uh, yes, uh, yes. I mean, we're putting out the podcast here right now, but I guess in the coming days, mm -hmm. we're going to put clips of that up. We're going to put clips of If we of remember to press record. <laughs> no, we did. Yeah, yeah, we right. recorded it <laughs> yeah. all three cameras. But yes, we're going to put uh, clips of it up, kind of like Rook moments where we put interesting moments of the interview. So for yeah, to see. look so for that on Telegram, thing. Instagram, and our, uh, our Rook extras. So basically, our website. Yep. rookmedia.com will put up clips from the interview we just did with uh, Armin if you want to see him Mr. Hoshtip I mean were you jealous that I was calling him Hoshtip uh, Captain Reza you're normally told, the guy was, yeah, yeah, yeah yeah and it was more so his salt and pepper hair that I don't have quite yet so yeah I was a little mm -hmm. bit jealous yeah. I'm like mm -hmm. how many Hoshtip are no, you don't have salt and pepper hair at all. No, I don't. Salt and pepper, jogandomi. Oh, very. Oh, interesting. Jogandomi. Muya jogandomi. Where does jogandomi come from? Jo is wheat. Jo is Jo and gandom. So I mean, what's jo? Jo is wheat. Barley. Oh yeah, ab jo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oats, oats, and then barley. Yeah, and then gandom is wheat. Sorry. So that somebody who has salt and pepper hair, they call him Muhaye Jogandomida. Uh, wheat and barley sound a lot closer together than salt and pepper. I know. But it's far like, for um, you, so what do you <laughs> like how are you gonna <laughs> These Iranians, <laughs> I tell you. What are they up to? <laughs> Makes zero sense. Um all right. Well uh I've been waiting to get to letters because I know that uh Keon's been saying that uh just handed them to me. We've got some uh some dissension in the letters. So let's get to it. It's Monday. Let's get to the letters of the week. Uh, yeah. Captain Reza. Dancing on his own. Captain Reza, he does not need ayahuasca. Looks like he might have taken he just ayahuasca. Needs, he just <laughs> needs the letters theme. Oh, blow up. Uh, all right. So two weeks ago, we posted a Rook moment that brought in a flood of opinions on the subject. It was from the interview with human rights attorney uh, Banafsha Akhlari, that would have been episode 44, where she discussed the resistance of Iranians to be seen as minorities or the others. Right. So this is where Iranians, despite the fact that we live in the West and others, uh, or that a lot of people would see us as uh, immigrants or minorities or others, that some mm -hmm. Iranians don't like to think that she was arguing like to think that we're we, we're uh, white yeah. people we're normal we're just like everybody else or so yeah we have quite a bit of uh, opinions that came in on that subject as you can imagine we had on instagram username far go 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 <laughs> 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 i don't know what that means but anyway uh he says is How do you know it's a he? It's a he. I oh, trust me on this. It's oh, okay. a he. <laughs> no, I clicked on the uh, oh, okay. on the username. Yes, and there's a man's picture on it. Right, right, so right. I I would imagine it's a man. No woman would come up with far go go go. <laughs> something as crazy as that. All right. So he says, is that really something Iranians do? In my experience, Iranians relish in being the black sheep of humanity. Also, it's obnoxious to use Aryan to describe Persian heritage. It's pointless academic compartmentalization is what it is. Persian culture ties back to 7,000 years ago. That's 3,000 years before the time of Indo-European migration. 
Hegel says history begins with Persia, not with Indo-Aryans. And if Persians are keen to tie themselves to a larger group, why not lay roots in Africa? Isn't it the cradle of humanity? Then aren't Persians actually African like every other person on the planet? I'd bet my firstborn that the significant majority of Persians identify their roots with either Cyrus the Great or Ferdowsi. We can go back further, but who's really thinking about their Aryan roots? Interesting letter. Thanks for that. I mean, yes, there are people who th think that, uh, who explicitly make the argument that uh, we're not people of color, we're not minorities, etc., because we're Aryan. Um, so uh, I, I think Fargo Go 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 knows that too, because Fargo Go Go Go, <laughs> despite the um, uh, creative name, it sounds like a very smart person. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, th th that's actually very interesting history, talking about the 7,000 years ago, which is earlier than the 3,000 years ago of the Indo-European migration um, but uh, yeah the Aryan thing is something I've heard my whole life we are Aryan we are I mean we don't say like Aryan maybe I think maybe it's more people are more sensitive to it now all of a sudden we don't want to be called Aryan because of the white supremacist stuff and people talking about Aryans and you know but uh, but that is an argument that a lot of Persians have used I find over the years and I, I, I must say there is another thing to be uh, mindful of and this is this comes from someone who lived in Iran for m most of my life half of my life and when I was in Iran like the whole idea of Aryan Brotherhood and Nazis and stuff like that it wasn't it's not that it's not because of Iran's position on obviously Holocaust and stuff like that it's not as uh, well known and as people are not as informed especially about the name Aryan or Aryan right. Brotherhood we call it Aryai or Arya and it's something to that Iranians take pride um, to and they're proud of so um, it, it's something to be mindful of right. as well well anyway Fargo go go Fargo go 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 he calls that obnoxious to describe yourself that way but see even Iran itself is so diverse you have like every color under the sun um, for skin color every type of hair so you can't really we, we can't all be under the same bucket, I'd say. Well, we spent about two hours on this on that show, episode 44. So I think that's the best <laughs> place to go to to listen to this rather than us trying to relitigate it in a ham-fisted way here. But um, what else we got on that? So, uh, and then we have username Dukhtar Sahra. Uh, she wrote in Finglish. She wrote, In interview, Aslan Jazob Nabud. Chara az kah kuh misazan. Ki gofte Irania, the others hastan. Do you want to translate well, that? Well, so there, you, well, well, see, that person is then contradicting the, the Fargo Go Go with saying, actually, who says we're the others? We're, no, I don't even know anybody who says we're the others. Why are you building a, a mountain out of a molehill? This is uh, that nobody says that we're the others. So there you go. <laughs> oh, yeah, two letters, we've heard the, the opposites. Uh, Diversity, I tell you. Yeah. Do you know who is Dr. Sahra? No. <laughs> That's part of a song. <laughs> oh, oh. oh, it's not actually somebody who's the daughter of a. <laughs> no, that's Sam. an Andy song. Oh, okay, man. I, I forgot about that. Small line. Okay. That's not an Andy song, though. It is, it is. Yeah, Martin. Andy and. Uh, no, no, no. Martin Martin Andy and Kuro. Andy and Kuro. Cool it's Martin. No, it's Martin. It's Martin. It's Martin. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's Martin. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I thought oh, Andy and Kuro sang that's the, Okay, but Andy and Kuro is popular. I, I, like, I, like, I like that song. Yeah. Nilofar, oh, Nilofar. Yeah, I used no, to wish my name was Nilofar from that song. No way. <laughs> anyway, so we uh, next up we have username Iceman99. And uh, so some these usernames don't have their names listed. Otherwise, I would have. By the way, the Iceman 99 comes from an Ebby song it's a, <laughs> where he references the Iceman. <laughs> Iceman in <laughs> Iceman in Club. So he says, and yes, it is a he, he says, our language also points to this phenomenon. We refer to the people of the country which we are in as Khariji, exactly. when in reality, aren't we the real Khariji? I always found this to be quite funny, especially when I had to tell my white friends my mom just called them a foreigner. Maybe <laughs> Fabulous Kian or Mona from Melbourne can help us understand this one. Oh Well, well this was also discussed on that episode. Yeah, absolutely. That's a funny contradiction of ours. Cool. And then on Facebook, we have Sara, last name Ross. She says, love Gian and the Rook team. You're absolutely the best. But about this episode... Unfortunately, I did not understand the subject at all. It is ridiculous. Resistance of Iranians in being seen as minority or the other? Is that really a subject? 
an important and crucial subject? In a country like America? I love Rook, but sometimes I wonder how they don't consider who they invite as a guest without any challenging questions. Thank you for that, Sarah. Sarah, I really hope that uh, this wasn't an episode. We played a Rook moment from the episode. I really hope that you would go to the whole episode, uh, which is number 44. Listen to the whole thing because, um, like I said, it was a long conversation. Uh, I mean, it's one that we'll have, I'm sure, many, many other times again. But uh, I think that there were some uh, challenging questions uh, asked there. And in fact, we followed it up, if I remember correctly, with a Rook Roundtable where we were talking about this. uh, And and we came, there were all kinds of different uh, thoughts on it. So, um, So, Sarah, Thank you for your letter, and please go check out that episode. 44. 44. And then we have some general letters that came in. We have a Todd Bobby wrote, Without your superb interviews, we would never be introduced to so many who contribute so much. Thanks, Gian. Thank you, Todd. Appreciate that. And then we have Massimo Asili wrote, Thank you so much for your amazing podcast. I enjoy listening to you when I go for my daily walks. Beautiful. Uh, Rook is pro walking. <laughs> we are a pro walking show. That's right. That's my sister does that too. My sister listens. Like she goes for walks. That's her podcast time when she really? goes for a walk. Yeah. It's lovely. Chef Great Haas idea. Does that. He said he was he, he did that too. Chef Haas says he's running a hundred miles every. <laughs> how's San Francisco? Oh, I just came from a. You know, I don't know how to do his accent. I got to work on it. <laughs> ship milk. I had some ship milk. <laughs> it's great. Sounds like yeah. Shia. Yeah. <laughs> no. No, no. This is shy. Um, um, we can decide. <laughs> Why is Shia That's my grandfather, older? actually. <laughs> He's getting older. He's getting older I, by the second. Oh, but there is an improvement the from, are, like, there was a time where he couldn't tell the difference between Shia's impression or Jean's mom. mom. Right. Like, it was right. becoming one. Uh, this is my mom. And... <laughs> this is Shia. They're very similar. But Shia just clears his throat more than my mom. Yeah, right. yeah. Hold honey, on. Honey, are you coming for dinner? <laughs> Would you come for dinner? It's very similar. All right. But I'm we're at the end gonna, of the show. So I'm going to divert that. Burn off some bad humor. Yeah. <laughs> Take that over to the letter of the week. Woo! Woo! So this week's Letter of the Week goes to Shadi Zavi. She says, Hi, Gian and Rook team. Thank you for another great interview and introducing us to another successful Iranian. By the way, I started listening to Rook since the first episode, and I have to say, Gian Jun, your Farsi has improved a lot. (laughs) You know what? Uh, I'm just reading this here, and I love that letter. Thank you, Shadi. Also, everybody named Shadi is always, they're always the best, you know. But now I notice that she says, Jianjin, your Farsi has improved a lot and then has like a laughing emo- emoticon. <laughs> like a laughing emoji, like, ha ha. That, how is that the letter of the day? I forbid this from me. <laughs> She's complimenting you, kind of. She's in not a way. actually yeah. complimenting me. She's, Masra uh, Bebin. <laughs> Hey, you should thank Shia. He's actually Shia. Listen, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, it's true. Shia and vice versa, and English vice versa. For sure. Shia, Shia used to be so interesting because he couldn't speak the. Shia is like a he's friggin' Shakespeare over there now. He's, his his English is so good. I'm I mean, I'm you. telling you, by next year yeah. we have to replace Shia because because <laughs> we'll, we won't have a new like a guy who doesn't speak perfectly. He's gonna he's he's, he's like a professor now. <laughs> we'll take applications for newcomers. Yeah, <laughs> if you speak badly, please uh, let us know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you uh, to all the letter writers. Uh, info at rookmedia.com or post on any of our platforms. Remember to go to our website to support us at rookmedia.com. Thank you, guys. This is full time for Rook for today. Our website, as I say, rookmedia.com. And a special thanks to the amazing team who put this show together each week. That's producer Susan. Lots of the artists. Thoughtful Negin, the fabulous Keon, Savvy, Savs, Roham, Aray Mehdad, Master Muhammad, Chef Haas, Captain Reza and Groovy Shaya. Thank you to all of you out there for supporting us, sharing our content. Listen, besides uh, becoming patrons, you can also just 
Make sure you're subscribed on whatever platform you're on so that you get notifications with each new show if you haven't done that already. And you can find me on Instagram at Giangomeshi or Lost Somewhere on Clubhouse. <laughs> if I stay on it. Mizu and Bashi.